This is so long overdue because I feel like we've had ample opportunity over the years in person to do this, but yep. I've always been too busy fishing or screwing around yeah, or yeah. you taking photos of my wedding. Thank you, by the way. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so here we are. Well, there is, there's a chapter in my book, April, which is about a wedding. Oh, no. Um, but it, have you seen the book? No. And now I'm really scared. <laughs> well, the book's coming to you. Um, so I'm going to send you a book. Um, but um, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't say whose wedding it is, um, and I won't say any more. So uh, what? Can't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> people might have figured it out, but um, no, I felt it was like it was it was private, right? So it's your wedding. It's not for for broadcast. But it just talks about a trip where I photographed a wedding, and either side of that, I I had amazing steelhead fishing with Jimmy Allen. Um, and, and you took me down to, you remember that place field and stream, is it down from your yeah, place? Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple of runs yeah, down. So that afternoon, I mean, I mean, we were all pretty whacked out, right? Cause it was a, it was a great wedding. And I remember staying up half the night with, um, with a bunch of your buddies, Will Bush and a bunch of people. And uh, I don't know where Charles and, and yourself had got to. But... <laughs> <laughs> we went to the bear club. We went to the kiss yeah. box. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I'm talking about your wedding because because you have that crazy thing in Canada where you have a big night before the wedding, right? Which oh, to me that's is right. Remember, I, I don't know if that's necessarily a thing, but that certainly oh, happened right. with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so because I remember, so Charles and Rob, yeah, and I stayed in that little place. So Bearclaw, I've got some little kind of cabin. Yeah, the Yakufore cabin. Yeah, and I woke up and I was like, shit, what time is it? And we were all completely <laughs> wasted. And then we had to drive all the way back to Smithers, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, no, to your... To my place. Uh, yeah, place. just on the Smithers, yeah. yeah. And Which now I know why my husband There's reaped a booze right? when so he in... said I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I I, I think I drive, it's all a bit hazy because I went, Charles was wasted. Nice. Rob was wasted. I woke up on the, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm there like getting my beauty rest, thinking that everyone's getting their rest before the wedding. So yeah. it's all coming out. Keep talking. I'm listening. I'm listening. Yeah, yeah, sure. So then we drove along that logging road, nearly died about half a dozen times because we were driving fast, right? And you get those big logging trucks and because we were late. And then we got there and you weren't there because you probably were wasted too, I guess. No, so no, I was trying to fit my the... dress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. You weren't there when we got there. You weren't there because we got to that. You were getting fixed up in a hotel. Um, oh, I remember. Because remember that same day, I went back early to build a boat ramp. I don't know if you remember this, but it was the day ramp. of my wedding and I'm building a boat ramp. And at the yeah. same time, while I'm trying to build this boat ramp, which everyone's like, are you insane? What are you doing? And I'm going, it's, I don't, I actually don't need that long to get ready, believe it or not. So we're doing the boat ramp and then Colby got attacked by a porcupine. Yes. So then I had to bring Colby into the vet on my wedding day to do this emergency yeah, yeah. surgery. What a shit. So that's show. why you were late. That's why you were late. It's all coming we, together now. Yep. I mean, listen, we I didn't we didn't know that had happened. And we were all wasted because it was a really big night at Bear Claw the night before. And we kind of came fishtailing into the car park, you know, thinking, oh no, we're late, we're late. And you can photographer can't be late. And um, and then you weren't there. And I was like, shit, they're late, we're late, everyone's late for this <laughs> wedding. And uh, Rob Nicholson and I drank about three beers. He's Australian, right? So what are you going to do? So we went and sat in the bar and then then you arrived and then your mum sent me away. You remember, like you were half dressed and your mum's like, no, 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 you can't come in because I was going to make pictures of you getting. That's right. You were taking yeah. photos of the whole experience. And your mum, who is a sweetheart, was like, go away. And Donna, your sister's saying, come on in. And your mum's like, no, get out of here. They haven't got any clothes on. And I'm like, okay. But it was such it was a great wedding. It was a but 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 what I was gonna say was that on the day after the wedding, so we got yeah, you know, I mean I stayed up. So you you and Charles went off and you know it's your wedding night, right? So you went we there. actually went but, back to the kiss box to the bear claw and fell asleep. Because <laughs> okay. we had to go, we were fishing with Jimmy Allen the next day. But yes, it's right. all coming back to no, me. No, now. no, 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 because you took me fishing the next day. You had your you've got that lovely boat, you took uh, maybe maybe I missed today. <laughs> I think it was the day after. I think you probably recovered the next day. Right. Well, I remember going down. It was very hazy because it was it was a good 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 day. Um, but you took me down the river in your boat with Charles and Rob, and you dropped me off at this spot, which is downstream of your your place, about 
I don't know, half a mile, mile, which I think is called Field and Stream. Is that right? Yeah. Is there like a campsite there? Field and Stream. And I was, I was whacked out. And I, I was stumbling around and I didn't like the place you dropped me. I was like, no, nah, I don't dig this place. Oh, you're mad. And I walked downstream a bit. And then I thought, I'm actually walking through good water right here. I'm I'm in it. And I'm so wasted. What am I doing? Get out the water. And 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 so I got it, got out the water and I just sat on the bank. And there's a big, big stand of poplar trees that goes all the way down the river. And it blocks the sun off the water. And I saw a fish come up right where I'd been. I mean, literally where I'd been wading down the river. And I'd never caught steelhead on a dry fly. So I put on a dry fly that there's a great guy who um, you'll know. Him. He knows you. Um, he worked in one of the tackle shops. Um, what's he, a little guy. He's a great guy. He, he'd given me these dry flies. He said, if, if, you, if, you, know, if you think it's going to work, put one of these on. And I put it on and maybe two or three casts, boom. And I got my first steelhead on a dry fly. And then I got another one. And Rob and, Rob and Charles were up the river like half a mile. And then they saw me getting all these fish. So they came running down and Charles got one. And then I gave this fly to Rob, who never caught a steelhead on a dry fly. And we just had the best time. And it was, and then I had to go home. And I was like, what am I doing going home? I, I know you were home. there for such a short time. Yeah. Well, I had a job. So, you know, you remember I found rough kids. And I had a big job for Tesco, which is a big supermarket, you probably know, in, in the UK. Yeah. And I had to go home. And Rob Rob took me to the airport and he's like, see, uh, you know, I was like, no, I don't want to go. But I had to go uh, because, you know, work, work comes first. But it was um, it was a great wedding. And anyone who reads my book, I'm sort of, I, may, I went out of my way not to say it was your wedding because I felt it was a private thing, you know what I mean? Um, as long as you didn't say it was some crazy bridezilla or some alcoholic husband, then no, you'd be not, okay. No, not quite. But because I remember when you said, "Do you want to come and photograph the wedding?" And I was like, "Jeez, a long way to go to photograph a wedding." And any photographer will tell you, I've done a few weddings only for friends. I never, you know, shoot advertising work for ad agencies with, with kids, and you choose everyone, right? But with a wedding, you don't choose everyone, you know, and. You can only do it wrong, right? So I've done it for, I bet I've photographed maybe half a dozen weddings for good friends, like right. you and Charles and, and various other friends. And I dread it much more than a big, you know, high pressure advertising shoot, because if you screw it up, what are you going to do? You say, can we all come back next week? Yeah, you can know? we redo it? I hear this all the yeah. time from photographers. And I just want to let people who are listening know, we only had probably 20 people at our wedding. It was super low key. I mean, I planned the whole oh wedding goodness. on a satellite phone while I was guiding on the Dean. We got married on the bank of, our, of the river that I live on and only wanted people we loved there. And you obviously fell into that category. So we love you. And and just to set, um, to give some context, I mean, Charles and I met, I guess I met you and Charles both at the exact same, same time. time. I walked yeah. outside of this little cabin in, Nor in Norway and That's there right. were you two handsome men telling stories and you guys are both laughing and and the rest is history. But yeah, yeah I felt we fell history. in love with you. Well, I'll of tell story. you, I'll tell you, um, you may not know this, but I said to Charles, April really likes you, Charles, <laughs> really. And he was like, nah, mate, you know, Charles, he's like, nah, I don't think so. And then, and we had such a great time. It was just, that was such a great, I mean, I think, I think it was one fish caught the whole week. Right. I yeah. can't remember who bought it. Um, it escapes me. But anyway, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> um, but it was rock hard, right? The fish just hadn't arrived. But we had such a great time. But Charles and I just hit it off from the start. I'd never met Charles then. You know, it was the first time I met Charles. And I just, I had this kind of man crush on her. I just thought he's such a nice guy. Good, good company. And we fished hard, caught virtually nothing. Um, but one evening, I kept saying, I think April really likes you, Charles. <laughs> and he's like, nah, mate. And then you came walking up the river. And it was like a kind of one of those old hairspray ads because you were backlit. And I'm not going to blow too much smoke up your ass, but you look fantastic. And <laughs> Charles you. jumped up like in a split second. And he ran down to the, And Charles is quite, he's quite handy with a spray rod, right? Agreed. He well, was since then. he started dating me, he is. But anyway, well, <laughs> sorry, continue. I say, so, <laughs> so I could just hear the conversation that you were having. And Charles is saying, 
ah, uh, could you show me that like backhanded cast you do? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then you're kind of leaning around him and it's all a bit touchy feely. And I thought, I remember yeah. all of this. It was like, yeah, yeah. I, I was sitting right the there on the bench teaching her how to do tennis. I was like, okay. I remember walking downstream. I had Brandy, no, Lana Del Rey in my ears. And I was like, uh-huh. you know what? This is the moment I'm going to go for it. And yeah, I did get hands on and gave a very physical casting lesson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for putting it in his ear because you're right. It went, it, that was the start of it all. And it all kind of just went yeah. from there. So yeah. you were, you were there. Let, let's get back to you from mm. before uh, Charles and I, let's talk about where, well, let's start at the very beginning because I have 10 million questions for you. You've got this mm. enormous career, this huge yeah. life. I mean, how old are you now? And that's not meant to be, that's, that's, I just really mean, like, are we covering? You'd, I'm if, 27 again. I'm no, 50, Char- Charles is 52. I'm 58. I'm 58. 58 years old. Okay. So we've and, got almost and, 60 years to pick through. We've got a lot to cover here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So go on. What do you want to ask? Where were you born and raised? I was born in um, a really humdrum little suburb of London called Uxbridge, which is right on the edge of London. Um and it's kind of suburbsville. I mean, it's not people, you know, I, I, so I was born in London. I wasn't really born in London. I was born in a humdrum little suburb called Uxbridge, which is about 10 miles north of Heathrow Airport. And it looks like all the other suburbs on the edge of London. But it was right on the, what we call the green belt. So it's where London ends and the countryside starts. So oh. that meant there was fishing, right? So, um, so uh i started fishing when i think i was seven and we had i didn't have a mentor you know i didn't have like my dad didn't fish my dad was a bit of a hippie and he thought fishing was cruel and blah 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 um and so i taught myself with a buddy of mine to fish and we i mean now the idea of two seven-year-old kids who couldn't swim i didn't learn to swim till i was nine going down to the river on their own. I mean, it's like a horror film, you know. Um, so we used to we used to literally clamber through a load of nettles and briars and brambles down to a little river that had white fish in it, perch, roach, gudgeon, little, little white fish. And we had no clue what we were doing, none. Um, and we, I had a thing called a combination rod, which is a rod that you can put together bits and pieces and if you so you can have a rod for catching halibut like a you know 60 pound boat boat class rod but the same handle will also be a float rod and then there's a fly rod handle what you put all the bits and pieces together and if you put them together in a certain way then you can have two rods right so we could both have but what that means is that my rod was like a a rod that you might use to catch conger eels with a fly rod handle with a fixable spinning reel on the end so it was a nightmare And we didn't know why you would. So we're fishing for fish, you know, like four inch, five inch, six inch fish. But no one said, well, you want light tackle for that. Right. So we thought, well, 20 pound line. Why would you want to have a five pound line or three pound line? So we had this, you know, that springy 20 pound mono that bounces off the spool and gets into a tangle in two seconds flat. We had huge floats that we bought from the pet shop. And the bait was worms, and the worms were literally bigger than the fish. So there were lobworms off of the garden lawn. So we had, no, but somehow, um, you know, I think back if there if it wasn't for the fact that there were perch in that river, you know, you know, perch, mm-hmm. um, it, perch are just a great fish for kids because they are dumb as rocks and they they want to eat stuff. Yeah. So if it had just been roach and rod and and gudgeon and bits and pieces. I would have caught nothing and I probably would have now I'd be painting watercolors or playing golf or something, you know, but I can remember it was a beautiful, clear little river. And I was watching this big lobworm coming down, you know, suspended under this enormous float on 20 pound mono and a beautiful little perch about seven inches long came up and ate this enormous lobworm. And I saw the whole thing float went under and I caught the fish and I, God knows what happened to that poor little fish because we were not skilled in unhook. We were not skilled in any way. Yeah. Um, but that was it. And I was a fisherman always. And I, I I can remember that moment like it was yesterday. So happy days. And then I, I, you know, as I got older, I got into course fishing. So 
that's bait fishing, you know, for whitefish rather than fly fishing. Right. Um, Wait, so are perch not considered a coarse fish in the UK? Yeah, so perch is a coarse fish. It is all, okay. Um, So so that's what I did. Um, And I got, I started match fishing when I was into my teens, which is like competition fishing. Oh. Um, And uh, I did a lot of that for, it's very much like working man's thing, you know? Um, we're in the UK, you know, the class system's alive and well. And my dad was from the East End of London, so we weren't a rich family. So that's what I did, you know. And I went and fished matches with all these guys who worked in the local factories and so on. And me and a buddy who also fished with me, um, we we couldn't afford the bait because we we're just kids, right? So the bait was expensive. Um, so we used to have a card school at, at school, you know, at lunchtime. And we used to have a lot of different rackets to make money. We used to go and collect golf balls um, from the undergrowth at the local golf club. And I used sell to them do back. that. Yes. Oh, right. And so, almost gets whacked in the head while you're doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, my buddy, Andy, who I hope will listen to this, who I still fish with. I was fishing with him last week. So we were at school together. And he, he, I mean, I, I had a sense of what was right and wrong. He would, he would stake out the greens that were not visible to the players, and the guy would chip his ball onto the green, and he'd run out and grab it. <gasps> <laughs> and then the guy would come to the green. <laughs> but then we got caught because we would sell them the balls back to people, and the guy would say, "Oh, that's my ball." Yeah, and I only. Got- Lost that ball about two hours ago on on the seventh green, you know. <laughs> so, but we used to get up to all sorts to, to 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 you know to pay for our bait, and we were good, and we used to compete with the with the grown ups, you know, and and win prizes, and and I loved it. But then I I was about twenty three years old, and I was walking around a lake with a girlfriend, and I saw someone fly fishing, oh. and I just thought that's that's it was just so cool you know watching the trout rise and the guy couldn't quite make the cast and they were just out of range and it was so tantalizing watching these fish come up you know and and kind of he and then finally made the you know one came into range and he made a good cast and he called the fish and i just thought i rushed home i bought a beginner's outfit you know like a you know all comes in a blister pack and then i went down to um by that time i was living right in west london and um, there was a reservoir, you know, like a dam very close by uh, that they stocked with with rainbow trout. And I went down there and um, I just, I'd forgotten that I, you need someone to show you what to do, right? So I was just thrashing around, just horror. I mean, I just <laughs> shuddered to think how bad I was. And I just couldn't get it done. And it was like, it was like being a little kid all over again because I just had no one to show me. And then a really lovely guy, um, a guy called Rod Ty, came over and he was like, give me that thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> He was funny. He was a sculptor. He was very, you know, he was an artist. So he was quite a bohemian character. He said, look, just slow down. Watch me. And he cast. And then he, I mean, he wasn't all handsy like you and Charles. He was like, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but, he, but he got, he, he got, you know, got me casting. And literally the first decent cast I made, I was sort of, you know, I was, just an absolute novice and he said right now put the line there through your fingers now retrieve it he said oh you've got one so he called it before i even knew i'd caught my first trout and then the line came up tight and i only stopped rainbow trout about i don't know pound and a half and i just fell in love with it and my from then on all of my coarse fishing gear you know all the all the floats and the bait that all sort of gathered dust in a corner and I just fell in love with fly fishing. So I came quite late to it. You know, I was 20, yeah. I think I was 23. But That's I was surprising. Was, yeah, I was. But I think a lot of, you'll hear a lot of people say um, in the UK, I mean, in the UK, fly fishing in days gone by was considered like, you know, kind of upper class thing, you know. Um, yeah. Well, you still hear that. These, yes, you do. You do. And um, I think that, um that's changed a lot which is good um Mm. you know um but but even then i mean what's that that is 30 years ago maybe 35 years ago and um you know it was quite lardy da to go fly fishing you know it's what the the gentry did and you had to wear red corduroy trousers and you know what i mean it was very much a a thing that the, the the you know the upper class did and now you know it's much more 
there's I think there's been a lot of social mobility in the UK since then. Um, but it's now something that not everyone does, but people from various sort of you know social strata do. So which is which is great. But I just fell in love with it. I love the mobility because because when you course fish, you had all this stuff. So you had a big fiberglass box and then you had a bag full of bait and nets and then you had a big tube with about half a dozen rods in it. And so it was really cumbersome. And then, you know, you know, the, one of the great beauties of fly fishing is you have a rod and you can have a little box of flies and some nylon and you, you're good to go. Maybe a net on your back. That's it. So that's I, I love that. So, yeah, I never look back. I mean, I just I still t- I tried to get my kids into course fishing. So I've got three boys. Uh, Charlie, Tom, and Pete, and they're all in their twenties now. Um, and as I was saying to you before we we kind of started recording, they're all home, which is great um, for Christmas. But they just didn't take to fishing, and that's fine because they do stuff. One of them's a dive master, um, one of them's a skiing instructor, and and Pete is just just works his socks off. He's still, you know, doing his studies, so that's good for you know by me. But um, but yeah, I just fell in love with fly fishing and I never I never looked back. I mean, it was just, you know, it was like love at first sight kind of thing. So I, I always yeah. assumed that it would have been the salmon that got you. Because I know you obviously love no. salmon now, but it wasn't salmon. It was the actual no, art no. of fly fishing. Well, I you know, I caught the salmon. I caught my first salmon. I was already fly fishing, but I mean salmon fly fishing was expensive, right? Um, and some Someone invited me to go and fish on the River Wye in Wales, um, which is on the border with the with, with England. So it's kind of Western England. Um, and the first time I went, I caught salmon, uh, but spinning because the water was high. It was, you know, it was too dirty and fast for, for, for fly fishing. So they said, well, you can't fly fish, but you can spin. And I caught salmon and it didn't fight until it came in like a sack. And I was like, well, what's all the fuss about? You know, um, but then. I started, it's, well, it's a long story, but it, I'll be very brief. So I started um, to, you know, my career really took off and I was getting a lot of work and getting very busy photographing kids. Which you're going to um, have to explain I, at some point, by the way. Sure, sure. Um, but then I just, as the antidote to that, I started traveling with a fly rod and people started asking me to take pictures. And I went to Russia with a company called Roxton, who are an outfitters in the UK. And we went to a river called the Varzuga, which is just the mother load of salmon. <laughs> and I caught, I mean, even without being able to spay cast, um, some people have said that I still can't spay cast, but I, I disagree. I, I beg to differ. But um, but you know, I was thrashing around catching the trees behind me, and but I still caught about, I don't know, 50 salmon, uh, because you could not you could not not catch a salmon there. It was the river was literally full of them. And that's when I fell in love with them because you know they, when you when you see a wild Atlantic salmon, a fresh, especially a fresh one, it's just to me it's the most. I think it's the most beautiful fish there is, you know. So, um, so that's when I and that was about that was ninety nine, I think, maybe two thousand. So, you know, that's still a long time, twenty three years ago. Yeah, um, but there oh, was God, a lot of water gone yeah. under the bridge before that. So. It is 23 years. I cannot believe how fast. T- I mean, it's supposed yeah. to be 2024. For people listening, it's December 22nd here today. Uh-huh. Wow. It's, uh, yeah. it's about to be a new year. So you've said yep. a number of times you, you've mentioned photographing children. Let's just mm. explain what that is. Because I actually find your career, I feel like you have two careers. You've got your fishing career, but then also... Um, what, what are we going to call it? Your main career, your initial career? Yeah, yes, I think so. I mean, you know, fishing. I mean, I worked for Hardy's. Uh, I did a lot of work for Rio when Simon, our mutual friend Simon Gorsworth, who's one of my great heroes, was working. Um, you know, Simon was for a long time was in charge of all of their marketing. I did a lot of work with him, but I mean, it's peanuts compared with mainstream advertising, as we all all know. And I used to, if I got a nice check from Rio or Hardy or I used to leave it on the kitchen table so my wife would see it. So I could say, <laughs> look, you see, it right. does pay some money. Um, but, you know, what has paid the rent over the years is mainstream advertising, um, photographing kids for, for um, what do you call nappies? Diapers? Diapers. You so you, diapers? Yeah, so you know those really like, cute, like, Huggies and Pampers boxes yes. with the really yeah. adorable babies and diapers? That's you. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, yeah. Baby food, baby clothes. Um, and you remember, so I, <laughs> I can remember when we were in Norway and I was I was telling you how I got the kids to laugh, which yeah. I can remember you thought was funnier than any of the kids I've ever photographed. <laughs> no, I've, I've I got still think it's funny. Will you do it? Will you do it? <laughs> <With> the, yeah. <laughs> Give me a moment. Okay. So my main, so for anyone listening, the main, my main, you know, and, and my assistant, I have three girls work for me. And they always give me heaps of shit because they basically say I'm a one trick pony. And my, the way I get the kids to laugh is I do Donald Duck, right? So I go. <laughs> and do it again. That doesn't it, look right, the, the camera go, didn't pick it up. <laughs> do it again. Do it again. <laughs> and then I start talking. Like, so I go. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes every kid thinks it's hilarious and you look like the king of the world and there's all these big shots from the ad agency you know people come from all over all over europe occasionally from the states canada and when every kid finds that funny you just feel like the king of the world because they you're just snapping away and the kids like gurgling with laughter but some days it doesn't work and when it doesn't work i'm stuffed but but luckily i had three great girls who worked for me katie um joe and louise and they had a bunch of tricks as well. So between us, I, I had a few other things. We, I mean, very briefly, because uh, this is a bit off topic as far as fly fishing goes. It's okay. What we used to do was, I used to, and I discovered this by accident, we used to wrap the camera up with fairy lights that put on a Christmas tree. And we had these great fairy lights that had this kind of controller button. And when you pressed it, you pressed it once, just the blue and yellow lights would light and then you press it again and the red and green lights would race around and then you press it again and all the lights would flash you know intermittently and we turn all the lights down low and so the kid is only going to look at that. there's nothing else to look at right so the kid looks and that, those lights would go right around the lens so the um the kid is always looking at the camera which is that's the first thing and the second thing is then you've got to make them laugh. And if they laugh, they will be looking at the camera because the lights around that camera are the only thing to look. The rest of the room is dark. Right. And it worked like a charm. And I used to jokingly make people swear they wouldn't tell anyone that because 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 all of my my competitors who I met, I'd often get asked to go to a, a, what we call a joint casting. And I can remember one guy who was my main competitor and they asked him to do the casting. In other words, he photographed all the kids. And I just got to sit there watching. And I thought, this is how he does it. And, and I realized how everyone else was doing was they would get mum to be right on their shoulder here to keep the baby happy. But the problem is the baby doesn't look. So I'm looking right at you now. But if mum's there, they don't look at the camera. They look at mum, right? So you don't get that really strong eye contact. And that's what I used to get paid for because you get that lovely, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, for really sure. Contact. And if you get that and laughter, then happy days, you know. So Ah, you're letting all your tricks out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, 58. I mean, in the book, there's a, a picture that um, one of the girls who works for me, Jo, is an absolute sweetheart. She would often photograph the shoot, you know, because we do stuff. We worked a lot for Carrefour in Paris. And they used to have these baby talent competitions that were always, they didn't realize that people would rig them. So they'd say, choose the best baby and then we'll photograph the three best ones. And you know how it goes with social media. So people would create accounts and then vote for the same baby. They weren't real people. So we get three babies and often they were not the cutest babies you've ever seen because it, they, you know, they just rigged the rigged. thing and got a bot to, to create accounts. Um, but Joe got a shot of this lovely little kid and me kind of on set. And I put it in the book. And Joe said, you can't put that in the book because it gives away your seat because you can see the lights around the camera. But I just thought, you know what? It's like I'm 58. So <laughs> maybe it's time to, to let people know. But it, but it served us really well, April, for, for a long, long time. Um, you know, but the, the problem was I was super busy. I was crazy busy, which is great. But I never had time for my family and I never had time to go fishing. Um, and I started to go a bit mad, you know, because you're just working every day. You know what it's like if you're working every day and you can fall out of love with something that, you know, I love photography. I absolutely love it. Um, but if you do it to the point where it takes your life over, then 
you know you so i was sitting in a meeting um mccain's do you have mccain oven chips where you are do you have those yes, things so like, absolutely so they're french fries what you call fries we call chips that you put in the oven so instead of frying them in a deep so they're healthier because they're they're effectively baked not fried um and mccain's is a canadian company by the way i think they are i think they are um and so i shot this picture of a kid so their, their strap line was um we don't play with our food i they don't put you know e numbers and shit into their food so um but the pictures were always kids playing with their food so we did uh, the one the first one that won loads of awards was a kid with chips in his mouth like like a vampire you know so they're like fangs ace venger as well we used to get all our kids from a stage school uh, or about five stage schools uh, so they could act right so they weren't just cute kids they were cute kids who could get into character and and have fun with it and this picture just was everywhere and it's just this little blonde haired kid with his mad eyes you know mugging up with the with his hands up like this with these fangs and then the lady from McCain, because it won won awards and so on. So this lady who was the client from McCain's just fell in love with my work. And she, every job McCain's did, it was me. But she was a bit kind of, oh, she's not listening. <laughs> she was a little bit crazy about the potatoes. And I remember sitting in a meeting in London in a big ad agency. And she was, she wanted to cast the potatoes. So when you cast the kids, basically you see a hundred kids. And like one off the other, and you say, right, look at the camera. And then I do my Donald Duck and a few other things, and we get them laughing. And then you take pictures of all of them, and then you say, like, we like these three kids, you know, and you present them. But this one wanted to cast the potatoes, right? So there's three. So one shot, there was a little kid looking over the top of the table, and he's got the big wide eyes, which you've got. To, so you've got to find a kid who can do that thing with the whites all the way around his eyes. Um, and there were three potatoes on the table and a bottle of uh, sunflower oil and some salt. And the line was, um, you won't believe what goes into our chips, i.e. just potatoes, salt and sunflower oil. And she was more interested in the three potatoes on the table than the kid, right? And I was like, no, no, no. The, no one even sees the potatoes. But she, So she had us bring in 10 big bags of potatoes put them on this huge varnished table in an ad agency in the West End of London and pick three potatoes. And and, and I I nearly got, I nearly lost the, the agency, the, the gig, because I couldn't take it. I was like a naughty little school kid. So one of them rolled off the table. And I was like, oh no, that was a really good one. <laughs> and the art director, who was a friend of mine, Paul, I, I worked with a lot. So he'd dream up the ad and then I'd shoot it. And he started laughing and he, he was laughing so bad. He had to leave the room and and then he came back and I was just playing it for laughs, trying to make him laugh when, you know, it's like a big deal to the, you know, it's big sort of million dollar account. And I, and, and the, uh, the client say, so Matt, I think you're the expert on this. Which ones do you like? And I held up a potato and I said, well, I really like this one, but I don't think it goes with any of the others. <laughs> and, <it's> like, <laughs> And now Paul's gone all over again and he had snot come out of his nose and he had to run out. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I need to, and I, and all the time I had the art buyer, who's the person who you deal with, like liaise on the logistics. She was kicking me under the table with her stilettos, you know, to shut the fuck up, excuse my French. Because, <laughs> they, you know, they're worried. But actually the, the woman from McCain's wasn't, she wasn't in, in it's a, there's a, there's a whole lot more to that story, but I think it's, it could go on for a long time. But, the reason I mentioned it was that I drove home from that meeting and I thought, I don't want to do this. I want to do something else for a while because I paid, I bought my house. Um, we had plenty of money in the bank. I thought, I want to do something else. So I came home and I said to Kath, my wife, who I love to bits to this day, I said, I want to go around the world for a year. Me, you, and the boys. And the boys were little boys and they were eight, five, and two. Oh, wow. And uh, she said, what are you talking about? Like anyone would, right? She said, you're having a, what's called a midlife career because cats are eminently sensible. And I've always been the mad one with the stupid ideas. So she said, you're just having a midlife crisis. She said, I've read about this because a midlife crisis was just a new thing back then. You know, it was oh, just, you know okay. Yeah. And yep. she's like, yeah, yeah, this is a midlife. I've read about this. You'll get over it. Okay. And then I went to work the next day and we photograph more kids and, da, 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 and back on the treadmill 
And I kind of forgot. I just thought, yeah, she's right. And then we went out for Valentine's Valentine's night. So I booked a nice restaurant in London and we went out and, you know, champagne and everything. And and she said, uh, you know, your idea about going around the world. So I said, yeah, it was crazy. It was, I don't know. I said, I was just a long day. And she said, no, no, let's do it. Let's do it. And I, yeah, that's what I was like. <laughs> so I was like, what? Yeah. And suddenly I was thinking about all the crazy implications of taking three little kids around the world for, for a year. Um, but it was a good time, actually. So she she persuaded, she said, no, it'd be great. We can teach them. You'll get to know them because you never, ever see them. So she gave me a bit of the guilt trip I was giving myself. Um, and there was what was happening right then. That was 2003. Digital photography was just coming in then. And I could see, and also um, picture libraries were coming in. So, and it was a perfect storm. So you had picture libraries, you had digital, and you also had a lot of health and safety stuff, which made my job much more difficult. Right. So, you know, you had to jump through a lot more hoops to get the shot done. You had to license every kid you photograph, a lot of paperwork, due diligence, and I was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. And I learned, I thought I've learned to use a digital camera. And I just take time off because I was, I mean, I really was going a bit nuts, you know. So we packed the bags up and we rented our house, which we owned. So we could rent it. We had a nice big house in London that we could rent. And and that fun part funded the whole thing. Um, and my studio lease had come to an end. So that was all good. So it was like sort of synergy. And I and I wrote for the Sunday Times, which is one of the big newspapers in the UK, um, one of the more sort of respectable newspapers. So they did a travel magazine. And I rang them and I said, look, I want to do a 10 page feature every month about our trip. And this lady that I spoke to, was the editor, she was like, who are you and what are you talking about? And I said, look, I'm taking my family around the world. I'm a, I'm a a journalist i didn't say fly fishing i just said i'm a journalist uh and i'm a professional photographer and i think it will you know make be interesting right so i said let me send you some stuff with a synopsis and a bunch of pictures and she was like well i'll have a look at it and she rang me the next day and said yeah do it let's do it and that was this is long before instagram and influencers and that culture but i was like one of the original influencers because that opened the door so i would phone up the whistler just up the road from from where you're from and say uh do you want to be in the sunday times like you know kind of effectively advertorial uh and they'd say well what what do you want so i'd say right me teach my me and my family to ski for a week and put us up and they would and you know it's it, everyone wins right they would plaster all over the sunday times it wasn't an ad because 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 and and i wrote it up as it was but we went, so we went all around Australia, which I fell in love with. I mean, we went, that was our first stop, really. So we flew to Perth um, via Singapore. My my kids smashed up Singapore Airport because they were wired by the time we got from London to Singapore. We got a we got a trolley, you know, the you know, the trolleys in the airport that you yeah. put with your baggage. And they the first thing they did was going straight into some kind of there was some big um display i think it was chanel perfume that just rammed that not that oh, all over wow. uh but any, and i thought this is a glimpse of the future right because we've got a year of this <laughs> <laughs> but we got to perth and then we drove from perth up to broome you've been mm -hmm. up there i love it up there but yes oh, croc crocodile oh, country amazing yeah and we saw and and it, i mean it, it sounds i'm almost a bit ashamed of it but that Sunday Times thing was like a free pass, right? So, I mean, we paid for our accommodation most places. Um, and, you know, it was long before Airbnb or any of that stuff. But we went from from um, from Perth. We drove all the way to Broome over about a month. And we saw, amazing, you know, the, 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 the pinnacles. You ever been there? No. They're these crazy rock formations in the desert. You know, and I really, you know, I I kind of I really did a job on it. So I researched it. So everywhere we went was photogenic and interesting for the kids. Me and Kath taught the kids mathsing. Well, we taught them. We had the national curriculum, which is the UK sort of teaching syllabus. And I loved it. I loved it. 
April, I, I would still be doing that now. Kath was ready to come home after a year, but I loved every minute of it. And we Where went else to, did we went you guys go? Before. You did Australia? We went, we around Australia for three. Oh, and the one other thing I did was I wrote for Trout and Salmon magazine in the UK every month, which opened doors to some amazing fishing. So I went to a lot of the places you all know in Australia um, and hooked up with some amazing people. Some of them I already knew. I knew Pete Morse and and um, uh, Fish. Do you know Fish Phyllisgirk? Uh, of, but I haven't met Alan, yet. Alan uh, Fish, yep. Right. I mean, and, and i got to say, I mean, I actually met them about three or four years before that. And I was a rank novice and they were world class. And it was, you know, I think back, it's embarrassing to think, you know, they just were, Pete Morse is one of the great, both of them, the great. Love that man. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, But I went, I, every, every week I do a week, I do a day. The theory was, I'm hoping Cass not going to come and break the news that it didn't quite work like that. But the theory was every week I would do a day's fishing somewhere. And she would get the day off from the kids and I'd have the kids and she'd do whatever she wanted to do. But actually, sometimes it was a bit more than a day's fishing. I um, don't say. And you can imagine. But <laughs> but but it worked pretty well. I mean, it, it, we we had some amazing adventures. We went all around Australia, um, which has got amazing fishing, amazing fish. And one of the one of the great sort of um uh, not regrets, but so there's Australia's not in my book. And the reason it's not in my book is I don't have the quality of so I haven't been fly fishing in Australia for 20 years, which is a great regret. And yes, correct. And so I'm coming to see you whether you like it or not. Yeah, there's no excuse for that. In, we'll have to change in volume that. two, that you know, and I've done it all, but I don't have the pictures. And off, you know, because photographing fly fishing is very different from just fly fishing. So I need to put that right for, for volume two, which I'm working on. But we went all around Australia for three months. Then we went to New Zealand for four months, oh. which I loved. Absolutely. And I, I met a guy, Craig Simpson. Did you ever meet Craig? Charles knows you know Craig. Felix. Did you oh, know, I know Craig? Felix. Well, Charles knows Craig. I think I may have met Craig and I know Felix very well. Craig, well, I'm sure Charles already knows, but Craig passed away this year. Um, oh. Craig Simpson passed away about six months ago. And I don't mind admitting I shed tears when I heard that because I loved that guy so much. And the, so one of the chapters in my book is all about fishing with Craig Simpson. And, um, you know, he kind of worked with Felix. So I know you know Felix, who who now has let Owen River go um, to 11. But I met Felix first at Lake Rotorua and just had a scream with him. He's a, just a great, great guy. And we really got on. And then he told me he'd taken over Owen River. Um, but Craig was just, he was a whiz. I mean, he was a genius and and a proper Kiwi. So, you know, I'd be there in my waders and my thermals and my, you know, and Craig would be wearing shorts and boots, you know, and, and, and calling my, sexuality it's a question basically <laughs> laughing at me at this pom you know who needs to wear neoprene and this and that um but he was a lovely man and i really cried when he when he died because i just you know i never thought i wouldn't fish with him again you know and fishing with him was it was just such a we caught some fantastic fish together you know and i would have walked past every one of those fish i wouldn't have seen any of them you know and craig who was very um he was he was just a great great company and and but he could take the piss so if he'd say you don't want to catch that one and you're like which one so that one and i would be there for 20 minutes i would not see that fish and then he and then finally you'd see it you know and he said oh you can see it and then you think how the hell did i not see because it's plain as day i'm sure you've done that yeah once or twice where once you see them so so cry i've i'd already fished with craig but I know I hadn't. I'd been to Easter Guide at Lake Rotorua, and I met him and Boris Ketch. Do you know Boris, German, German Kiwi guy? And Boris is brilliant, but Boris makes me uptight because he's very Germanic. You know, so when you stuff it up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to all the, if there's any German folk listening because that is a terrible stereotype. But Boris was a brilliant guide, but I, he just made me because because you know that fishing, you've got to. You, it's not whether you can do it it's whether you do whether you've got the bottle to do it you know whether you keep it together because first cast is the only cast right 
and with and with Craig, I'd relax, you know, because he was just a lovely guy to be. Boris is a lovely guy, but Boris, when you stuffed it up, he wouldn't say anything, but you knew he was pissed, you know, and he'd walk off and you're like, okay, coming. <laughs> and I and so I caught I had a day with Craig. Um and we caught we caught brown trout of five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten pounds, which is like I mean freaky for a start, but amazing. And then I would always go back and fish with him. And we caught some amazing, like big, big wild brown trout. And I'll miss him. And I, you know, it's so sad. You think shit, people are gonna pass a few few people in the fly fishing world this this year have passed away, you know, and it and it's sobering, you know. Ollie Edwards, did you ever meet Ollie Edwards? Ollie Edwards yeah. was a flight Yorkshireman, which is north of England. Just a genius. I mean, it, it talk like that, you know, the Yorkshire accent. Brilliant flight, amazing fly tire, and so knowledgeable and so funny. A lot of people, I think, probably thought Ollie was a dry old stick, you know, because he was very technical and he knew all the Latin names of the bugs. And but he was the funniest guy you could ever meet, you know. And he passed away this year, and it and it really makes you think, you know, this stuff's not forever. So, um, but anyway, so I fished with Craig and all around New Zealand, did a lot of fishing on my own, which was, was an education. Um, and then we went to Fiji, which was amazing. We went to Tahiti, which was also amazing. Then we came to your neck of the woods. So we flew to Vancouver and we went and learned to ski at the Whistler. And then we went all around the Western United States and did all those amazing kind of like it was like a homage to you know the madison and the green and the, uh, the, the all all of those rivers that you read about i did all of them and wrote about all of them and loved all of them the madison river i just just fantastic place near, near, you know kelly gallup i know you've you've spent so i was right opposite kelly gallup's place for about three weeks and i used to fish all the crazy times when i was you know my once my kids are up We'd have to go off to see Virginia City or or, or Yellowstone or, or you know the the, the um, Old Faithful and all that stuff. So I'd often be out fishing at four in the morning or midnight under Varney Bridge, skating flies, and I loved it. And and you know when you see what you've got in the states and Canada, then the UK does seem very crowded. You know, and, and the fishing we have. I mean, there's sixty million people wedged onto a, a little island side of you know the size of Rhode Island so it's it's kind of a it's it, it's quite an eye opener to see all that and then when I when I came back and I picked up the the kids photography again it was just calling to me all the time I want to go traveling you know I want to go you know I, it really put the hook in me um and you know I found a way to make some money out of it which is important um but you know it, it I just fell in love with tra that that year away just i just fell in love with seeing the world you know and fly fishing takes you to some amazing places that people don't know you know so you're not in a queue to see the taj mahal or machu picchu or some place you know i, I was talking to a friend about this you you if you go to see those places they're going to be a disappointment because you've seen those you know those pictures in the brochure mm -hmm. that they've picked from all the pictures that were ever taken of the Taj Mahal or whether you know they've got a beautiful dawn picture but actually you go and it's a shitty Wednesday afternoon and it's raining and you know there's a queue around the block and all that stuff some kids nicked your wallet and you know it's whereas I was just out with a guy you know Marcelo Perez you know Marcelo oh yeah 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 so I went to Bolivia with Marcelo in September and we went to places that Marcelo is adamant no one has ever been to. And when he says no one, he means, not, you know, like the indigenous folks only go so far because, you know, they don't have a helicopter, right? So, uh, And once you start going over mountains and so on, so you're going to valleys with no people. Um and you wouldn't go there on a package holiday, you know. No, you, 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 I know these trips that you're talking about. I yeah, actually had Marcelo yeah. on the show. When he says no one, he yeah. very well means no one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, may, I mean, we saw it. So we're in the heli and we're flying in and you know, he had a great captain. Who's, he was called Cappy, which is obviously captain. So I don't know the captain's name, but he was a brilliant pilot. I mean, he was up there with some of those Kiwi guys. So he would drop you into these little narrow valleys and you're always nervous as hell because you hear that you know they're on the robinsons they, the robinson helicopter has that alert going dee, 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 to tell you that the rotor plates are very close to something and he just dropped you on a sixpence 
and we got out one morning and there was a tap here at the other end of the of the run and i was like quick get the long lens on so i've got my camera gear on and i put a long telephoto lens and the tap here just jumped in the river and swam towards us and popped up right in front so i'm trying to take this long lens off which is what you photograph wild animals with because they're shy and retiring because he's come to say hello you know so i'm bolting the short lens back on the camera and i got two frames before i mean he popped up i could have if i'd have had a rod in my hand i could have touched him on the nose with it and he popped up and he, then he then he got a fright you know and then he was gone but it was it was amazing absolutely and to meet those folks you've done that trip haven't you yes but it's you my favorite it. trip to date yeah yeah it is and and it's such a freaky place because it's like new zealand you know if you blur your eyes clear freestone you know cascades and and riff, rocky kind of riffles and except for the fact it's about 90 degrees so someone's put you in the oven and there are these freaky great big fish with and they're amazing because you see pictures of them and you think they would be, you know, so easy to see. But all you they're like a Cheshire cat, because all you see are the fins and the tail. Right? Yep. You know those golden fins? And they're not that easy to catch. You'd think they'd be dumb as rocks because they've never no. seen, but they're actually very, they can be super tricky. So you feel like you've achieved something when you catch one. You've got to get the car straight. I stuffed, oh, I started to think some of the cars I made. Because I was like a kid again. You know, you're like, it's like being a little kid. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I'm really grateful to Marcelo. I mean, it is that is one of the the great adventures in fly fishing, you know. Right. And like I say, most people would never think of going to the Bolivian jungle for any reason. You know, why yeah. would you go there? But the whole thing, meeting the um, you know, the Chimani folks. Yeah. The, the the indigenous folks so the first morning i was there so i went when they not when they first opened it up but in the early days and i hadn't been for 10 years and i went i went back and i just was in love with it i love that first when you wake up in the morning and the birds start singing and you hear all those crazy because the birds make some crazy noises so you know you're in the jungle and i go out on the porch and it's just getting light and the birds are singing and i got the drone out and I was, I mean, my excuse is that I was jet lagged, but I was just plain stupid, not for the first time. So I flew the drone. I love drones. I mean, drones are sort of, you know, they I because I like to shoot stills with drones. And it's I come from a time before drones. So you meet a lot of people who've grown up with them, you know, younger folks are like, yeah, to me, when the, it's like James Bond, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> and I flew the drone up in the air, and then I was busy watching the screen and forgot that you never fly it sideways because there's no sensor. So the way to fly a drone is always, you probably know this, is flight forwards so you can see where you're going. Right? So you don't sense, crash into anything because it's like driving a car, right? So you, you see it coming and then you stop. But anyway, I, I flew it sideways straight into a tree and the thing had been in the air for 30 seconds. And I was like, shit, that's my fucking drone. <laughs> you know, and I just got here and... The, the, the lodge man, Nico, who I've known, he, he's I've met him all over. And he came out and he just looked at me and said, have you crashed your drone? You know, I was standing there with that little controlling thing. And he's seen it happen dozens of times because obviously there's a lot of trees around. So he said, hang on. And he went and got this guy. Um, catch him. No, it wasn't Catch and Bimby. They've all got these amazing names. But a Chimani guy. And he said, where is it? And I had to figure out where it is from the GPS on the controller. So I walked towards it and I said, it's, it's like the tallest tree in the forest. And I said, what's he going to do? And he said, what do you think he's going to do? And I said, you can't let him climb up that tree. There's no branches. It's just a sheer trunk. It was, and, and the drone tells you how high up it is. So it was 11 and a half meters in the air oh. in a tree. And I said, you can't let him climb that tree. It'll break his neck. I mean, it's just straight up with no nothing to cling on to. Smooth, perfectly smooth tree trunk. And he said, yeah, I'll be fine. And the guy's already kind of getting rigged up to climb up this tree. And I was like, no, no, this isn't, it's only a drone. You know? I said, I, I've got to photograph this. And he said, well, be quick. I rushed into to my cabin, which was right behind me. And I bolted on a lens and I came out. The guy's halfway down the tree with the drone in his hand. You know, if you saw that tree, it was, there's no way that anyone that I've ever met could get up that tree. And he was up there and down again. I thought it would be, you know, like a third of the way up and looking for a purchase to get up the next. And he was up and down. And they are, they're the most healthy people in the world, apparently. They've got the best heart. You probably know all that stuff. Um, and they're great. And they, 
So this one guy that I took a shine to was Catch and Bimby, who came out with us guiding. Um, he would film. Mar- so when you see Marcelo on the on Instagram with all that amazing action, that's filmed by his buddy Catch and Bimby or the other guy whose name I can't remember. He's also brilliant with Marcelo's iPhone. And he just stands there and they're a whiz with the eye. As soon as we stop, they're out. They've got the iPhone out. They're ready to go. And they film all that amazing footage. And it is, you know, I think there became a bit of a formula with those fishing films, you know, and you get the drone shot and then you get the kind of off the peg rising music. You know, you think, yeah, I've seen this before. Well, that stuff, you know, I mean, look at the, the it's viral and it's just, it's like cinema verite, right? Because it's just an iPhone over someone's shoulder. And th- those things do everything else you could want to make a fishing film. So they're big, freaky golden fish that nail streamers, you know, in a river that's gin clear. So, yeah, it's one of the great places, you know. So happy days. So, you know, and and I think the likes of you and me are so lucky to go there, April. You know, there's there's not many people that 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 can go there, you know. So, no. you know. Happy days. It, cheers. It's a special spot. I'm actually so desperate to recreate that trip. I'm going to Guyana in February. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I paid for the trip. It's not like... Arapaima? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because right. I was like, why is this trip so... I, I had lunch with my buddy Sam Lundgren in Montana. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, what are you up to? I'm, he said, I'm going to Guyana. I said, that sounds like an adventure. I want to go. How much is it? And it was really quite affordable. And yeah. then I realized why it was so affordable. It's because it's a basically a 10-day camp in hammocks. Yes. And so I was like, let's, you live once. I can't die. Yeah. I've got a child now, but let's do it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you know how Guyana compares to Bolivia. Unless have you been to Guyana? No, I've been to, so, so Marcelo's partner is Rod Salas. I don't know if you know Rod. No. And Rod's uh, a, uh, yeah, uh, they're no. both, they're, well, Rod, so one of my kids got really sick. Um, and I was fishing at, for Arapaima, which is what I guess you're going to do in, in yes. Guyana. Um, so anyone who's listening who doesn't know what arapaima is, it's, it's just a freaking great big fish that grows up to about three and a half meters long, and they are just like no other fish. And I think Guyana was the first place where they had like Rewa. Are you going to Rewa? Which is the that was the first kind of organised fishery for arapaima. But then Rod found this place in the Solimoes River in Brazil, which has got lots of very big arapaima. And I went there and my kid got really, really sick, like life-threateningly sick. And Rod was brilliant because you are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And he, um, Rod got me out of there, which was really complicated, logistically very complicated. And I'm, you know, I will always be so grateful. And Charlie, my kid, he was sick. He's fine. He's, he's, he, but it was a scare, you know. Um, but I've always been very fond of Rod because he's that guy, right? So if something bad happens, you know, everything he drops everything to, to to get you home. Um, but he actually said, I couldn't get home for one day. And he said, come fishing. And I went fishing with him. And uh, his head guide is a guy called Rafael Costa. I also think it's a great guy. He's the guy with the ACDC hat. I don't know. You'll see him in lots of pictures. And uh, So he always wears this ACDC hat, which is quite incongruous for a big Brazilian guy, you know. Um, and we caught this massive arapaima, 239 centimetres. So that's a long fish. Right? How many feet is that? I know they get up to 10 I feet or bigger. I don't know. I don't know. I've no idea. Um, but it's a big, big thing. Um, and the jungle, I think part of the reason a lot of people are scared of the jungle, you know, they're they're like, and the jungle's actually it's almost disappointingly benign, you know. It's like where I've had one real scare in the jungle. Um the cat or a snake or a no was wasps. It? wasps. Wasps or bees. They're either wasps or bees or hornets. I think they might have been hornets, but they were really big and they were they were not very happy. So I got out of a boat and I put my arm against a tree. Oh no. And I must have shaken the tree. We had a massive storm, like you know, those tropical storms. And I got out of this boat and I put my hand on the tree. I took a pee. That's what I was doing. I got out of the boat to take a pee. And take a picture. That's right. I know what I was doing. So the when you get that white out. You're going to destroy your camera, but if you can get under a tree, you can photograph the rain because you've got an umbrella over your head, i.e., the tree. Which and and I love that. If you ever see that kind, there's a great painting when I was a kid, so I studied art obviously to do with photography. 
And one of my favourite paintings is a painting of a tiger in a jungle storm by Henry Russo. And, I, and when I'm in the jungle, it rains. I always think of that painting. And um, it's just an amazing thing to see that, you know, that absolute whiteout of sheet rain, like you never see anywhere else but the jungle. And um, and I got out to photograph and I put a hand, my hand on the on the tree. And I think what happened was I shook the tree and the next thing, these hornets, I think they were hornets, they were like two inches long, big. And the first thing they did was bite one of the guys in the boat, Zazino, who's the head guide at the lodge. And he was he was smart. He knew what was happening. And he just went to me like that, which meant jump in the water because they don't go underwater. But then so we all but They'll we all got badly stunned. For you to get out of the water. Exactly. So so it's one thing getting in the water, but literally every time. So we got under the boat, but we didn't have, it wasn't like the Tom and Jerry show where he has the snorkel. You know, we were, you've got to breathe, right? So I put my hands on the boat to pull myself up to breathe and I could feel them stinging my hand. It was like someone jabbing you with something sharp, you know, repeatedly in your hands. Came up, they're all over your face. It was really frightening, really frightening. Um, and then we swam across, though. We literally swam un, under the boat. We had this metal John boat. We swam across the lagoon. And all I could think about was the fact that there's all these big black caiman in that part of the of the river, yeah, which is basically big crocodiles, right? And I, I, that's all I thought about, and I just couldn't wait. But finally, and every time we came up, we get stung more. So the, the hornets came with us. Finally, we got right across the lagoon, and they left us alone. We got out. And we had a trainee kid who was like a trainee guide, and he was really in bad shape. So his face was all swollen up. And we had to, I think he was, I think he had to go out to that to fly him out to hospital. But anyway, we're all alive. So that's good. And I said to Zazino, he's the head guide, I said, I said to him, all I could think about was we're going to run into a big crop and the water's gin clear. there. So it's not like murky, which is probably good. Yeah. But you'd see a crop coming from a long way off. So it's like the ultimate horror film, right? Because you got first you're getting eaten alive, stung to pieces by these big hornets, and then you're going to run into a crop. And of course, so Zazino said, no, 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 this is fine here. It's like the, the story with the, the girls in the billabong up in Australia that, that were attacked by the crocs. So he said, no, there's no, you never see crocs here. And as he said it, big black came and pops up right there, right in front of us, like a big one. Would you know, they eat like, people? Because I, they let me wade up to my chest for a scary yeah. amount of time in that really big murky river. And then yeah, when we got the boat- you talking about? Uh, I can't remember what it's called. In the Bolivia, river, you're talking about- In, in Bolivia. The Secure, that's the Secure. And yes. Marcella was like, no, they don't attack people. They only eat, yeah. you know, fish. Well, when you see them, I mean, they're like dinosaurs, right? They are dinosaurs. But then like, yeah, you'd see are. them I mean, and they're as long as this countertop. Yeah. And I'm going, are you, I don't know if I like my odds on this. <laughs> I didn't get back in the water up to my chest again. I'll tell you yeah. that. I yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that, that lodge there, um, I'm not going to say where it is because they probably wouldn't thank me. And that's the, and I've been to that place. It's not one of Rodrigo's places, but I've been to this lodge I'm talking about. 10 times. I yeah. love it. Um, and uh, I've never, we've never had an incident of any kind. They've never had any safety stuff issues. Um, but, you know, you see that and you think, Jesus. Oh, and the other thing is they have piranhas there and they always say the same. Oh, no, you can wait. It's fine. And then you go into one of these lagoons and I always want to try and catch an arapaima there. And if the you go where the piranhas are and they literally shave that lovely big 10 inch flashy profile fly that you spent about an hour making. The piranhas will change. You know, suddenly it's like that long. It's two inches long. And they literally give it a proper haircut. And you think, that could have been my leg. But they always say it's fine. So, you know. <laughs> I have it because I have heard that there are piranhas where we're going. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, we'll have to compare notes. Well, and this, but this is what, I, you know, I'm sort of contradicting myself because I've fished in the jungle a lot. Um, and the... You know, the, the general attitude people have is that the jungle's this scary place. And now I've reinforced all that stuff, right? But I've fished in the jungle. I've fished with Rodrigo Marcelo. I've fished with, um, there's a, 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 I fished a lot in the jungle. I fished in Colombia, Brazil, um, Bolivia, obviously. Uh, and that's the one time, that thing with the hornets, that's the only time I've had a scare. I've probably fished, I bet you I've fished 25 weeks in the jungle. You know, and that's the one scare I've ever had. So, you know. okay. So it's so everyone listening, don't so be don't afraid. Be too, Marcelo yeah. would be sitting next be to you sensible. right now, giving you an elbow in the Yeah, no, I'm so, thinking yeah. he's like, oh, you <laughs> idiot, scaring everyone. 
<laughs> what about just back to your photography? Cause I have got more questions about destinations, but I'm just, I don't want to get too far ahead before I ask you about yeah, selling yeah. your first mm-hmm. image. I mean, I know you were writing for which magazine was it? The salmon? Oh, lots of the trout and salmon. It's the first magazine that I had a piece published in was trout and salmon, which is the, like the UK's slightly, I hope they're not listening. The, the slightly stuffy old English, you know, trout and salmon. So try and get a bonefish in there. Like, whoa, that's a bit exotic for us. you know. And I know the editor, Andrew, and if he's listening, <laughs> he's a great guy. But it's very much like our readers want to read about trout and salmon. You know, and you're like, no, come on. You know, there's a, there's a whole world out there. You know, even like, I mean, in the UK, we've got the, some of the biggest northern pike anywhere in the world. Let's have something about that. And I've managed to get a piece in there. And then, of course, you get the old crusty old sign. So I say, I don't buy trout and salmon to read about pike, rah, 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 you know, and then. So, um, but that was the first I wrote about the Yakanga River in Russia, which is one of my absolute favorite places. Um, and uh, that finally persuaded them. So, so was that, that your that first, happened. That just how did that all go down? Did you reach out to them and just say, I'm a photographer. Did they know who you were as a fishing personality at that time? No, no, no. I was, I, so I was, that would have been, that would have been 2001, I think. Um, and trout and salmon, right? So if you send them bonefish, tarpon, dorado, they have published them. I mean, you know, and I like to think that if the content's strong enough, it can break the door down, you know, and they'll say, okay, that is quite cool, you know. Uh, they still get people that, could, you know, there's always, it's the people, it's the grumpy old sods who make the noise. You know, the people who like it, they're too busy having a good time to write to Trout and Salmon and say, wow, I thought it was great to see this new species in, but the stuffy old bastards who, you know, who, who get off on being grumpy, they're the ones who say, look, I don't buy this magazine to read about that, um, uh, what are they called? Um, peacock bass. Right. They published a piece about peacock bass and, um, they got so many complaints, you know, that they're not trout or salmon. And the editor was like, because he'd done, you know, he said, no, all right, we'll go with it. And then he said, look, there you go, you see. And, you know, and I, if I was smart, I would have got all my buddies to say right in as, you know, Joe Soap and say, hey, it's great to see peacock bass in trout. But I didn't because I'm not smart. Um, but you, so I went to the Yakanga River in Russia in 2001. And I was still, I couldn't spay cast at all but luckily you're on the tundra right so the tundra's flat so no trees so you could overhead cast and i just fell in love with that place that's when i really fell in love with 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 salmon with atlantic salmon and the salmon in that river are they're just unique you know they're like no other sal- you know i've fished i fished the alta i'm i'm lucky you know i've fished a lot of the famous atlantic salmon rivers and steelhead rivers um and um they're just unique they're just they're like so they've got these shoulders on them that, that, that people I've I've known people who see pictures of them. They say, what species is that? Because they don't look like other Atlantis. They don't like you've got a big fish on the gala, right? Remember that? Which is great. I remember seeing that. We'd, we'd never forget that. We'd have laid on the, on the oh, that one too. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And the gala fish are beautiful, but the gala fish look like Atlantic salmon. You know, they they're do. beautiful, very sleek, classic shape of the the akanga fish look like mike tyson you know it's like they're pumped up on steroids or something i've done mike tyson's listening i'm not <laughs> i'm not i'm not accusing you of anything like <laughs> but they looked different and the, the reason i mean if you fly down that river in a helicopter you see why they're different because the river is so gnarly you know huge rapids and they've got to get up that so they've kind of evolved into this um different you know, just a very different sort of physiology, and they're magnificent fish. Charles went there, didn't he? And Charles, yeah, the last it time I saw you, birthday present. I was supposed to go with him, and you were, you were pregnant with Adelaide, on, and I went to the gala. Oh, that's right. That other time, because the first time he went, oh no, that's I was pregnant. I bought it for him as a birthday present. Yeah, that's true. And that's, also that's wanted to go, and then you bastards, you had said, one of you had said to him that women couldn't go because the camp was too dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. The camp said that. The camp oh, said the camp that. had said that, yes. And the so I was like, screw and, these guys. And, and so I booked is, my own yeah, trip and, <laughs> to a different yeah, spot of did. Russia. I remember, I remember. And I was, I mean, listen, that's that's fair comment. But the camp said to me at the time, and now women, well, no one goes to the Kanga right now because 
Putin's doing all the hideous things that he's doing. So it's shut. But um, but it was, I mean, listen, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to shirk it because I did tell you that. And I and I'm a bit ashamed of it because, but that's that was the attitude then. And attitudes have changed about women and fishing. But then it was, you know, that's 20 years ago. 20, no, less, 10 years ago. And it was all a bit kind of oh, it's and it is a big nasty river, don't you? But you are a uh, again, I'm not gonna blow too much smoke over us, but you're a toughie, right? And you would be good as gold on that river. But it was very much like all oh, women, you know. I mean, people have drowned in that river. Um, but you know, there's old guys fishing it, you know, who I would you know, who am I betting on April or a 75-year-old guy? I'll take, I'll take that bet. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So my but apologies. You, you guys did go to Russia. Now he well, I didn't that. go with Charles. For some reason, I I think I had to go the week after because I got a job or something happened. Something did well, happen. I didn't go with Charles. But it segues uh, me perfectly though into Atlantic salmon photography because when I think of Atlantic salmon anglers, specifically angling photographers, I think of you. Did right. you mean to do that? Because I feel like you have yeah. definitely painted yourself this the specialized niche in that field. Right. That's interesting. I didn't, I mean, I don't know. I didn't know that. Um, I love Atlantic Sam. I love the two fish that I really love are permit and Atlantic salmon. And they're such, they're like polar opposites, right? So Atlantic salmon, blind fishing. I mean, Iceland, I, I love Iceland, but not for salmon. I love trout fishing in Iceland. Right. But this is going to sound, there's probably something Freudian about this, but the fish aren't very big. And a, and a big Atlantic, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I'm sure a psychologist could tell you what's going on there. But but um, but I love big Atlantic salmon. And the yeah. fish in Russia are big on the north coast of the Kola. And those fish, when you hook one of those Yakanga fish, not only are they big, but they're so they're titanically strong. There's a do you know Ryan Peterson? Did you ever run into Ryan? No, Ryan's from Alaska. He worked for the fly shop. He worked for the, I think, the Wild Salmon Center. He's Ryan's a good guy. He's done a lot of good work, conservation stuff. Big, tall, skinny kid. Great kid. Um, Ryan came to, to Yakanga, and all the way there, he was boring the shit out of everyone talking about steelhead. It's like steelhead this and steelhead that and steelhead are the best. And da, da, da. And I said, well, Ryan, just wait till you've got one of these things. And I took him down the first evening. By sheer chance, we, me and my buddy got left bank Liliot, which is the pool at the bottom of the, um, it's, it's 200 yards from the home, from the, from the lodge. So you could walk downstream back to maybe 300 yards and we were left bank and he was right bank. And so I said, I showed him what to, I said, like, start here. You've got to cover that rock and that and gave him a kind of quick sort of rundown of what to do. And then we went across the river in a boat. The river's wide there. It's like 150, maybe 200 yards wide. And um, and I got into a fish straight away that was like 24 pounds, which on your kanga is nothing. I mean, it's like no one even, you know, it's like, yeah, great. That's it. Um, and Ryan was shouting abuse at me from across the river saying, do you drag up? And these things pull. I mean, if this was early season, so there's chrome fish. And, and I was shouting some abuse back at him. And I got the fish in and we took some pictures, let it go. And then Ryan got into a fish from the other side of the river and the fish came straight over to me jumped straight out of the water and i thought well that's a big big fish and then it took off and of course so now i'm shouting all the abuse at ryan to do his drag up and it took him straight out the back of the pool took everything he's got and i think i'm right in saying it spooled him but it's still a long time ago but it certainly beat him up pretty bad and he lost it and i think he lost quite a lot of tackle with it um and we didn't hear anything about steelhead. And I know and for the rest of the week. And I know there is this sort of, you know what I'm talking about, is steelheads. That they're both great fish. And, uh, you know, I fished the Dean where you used to, I think you guided it. Um, yeah, for years. You guided at Blackwells, right? Yeah. Did you go to Blackwells? Yeah, yeah. yeah that was where I caught my first steelhead. Oh, my there was goodness. A, did you know a guy, know Dave Chamberlain? Did you ever meet Dave Chamberlain? Of, but again, because didn't he, did he guide there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I before loved me. It. I loved it. So I went to Blackwell's. So it's a long story. But on that trip I told you about, someone told me they could get me on the Dean River, Lower Dean, which was Blackwell's camp. And I flew up there, and then John Blackwell, he's a lovely guy. I, I, John's one of the sweetest people you'd ever meet. 
And he said, no, no, we can't get you on the Dean. We can take you trout fishing on the on the Blackwater and we can take you to the this river and that river, but we can't get you. The Dean's like dead men's shoes. And I'd been stiffed by this British agent who, anyway. And But John could see I was like almost in tears. I was so close. They, we walked the bank. We walked along, you know, the big cut bank right off oh, Sydney. Yeah, Korea. absolutely. And I was like, it's right there. Can't I just have a look? <laughs> so I didn't fish it. <gasps> but John was such a sweet guy. And I wrote a piece. I didn't bitch about it. I just thought, right, to be professional. So he took me out to this amazing river full of salmon, coho, all sorts, everything, um, right out on the coast. And he had a little float plane. And we yep. caught just bucket loads of salmon. When we landed, there was this black stuff in the water. And I was like, what's that? And he said, well, you know, on the ca- in, in the plane. And he said, what do you think it is? And I said, I don't know. And he Kevin. said, come on. He said, come on, sharpen up. I said, it's not fish, is it? He said, yeah, of course it is. Like like millions of, of fish. And we walked up that little river. I've no idea the name of that river. Um, Was it the Kim Squid? Pilot. No, I don't, honestly don't know. I, I, I don't There's think so many it. rivers there. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But the one thing with that river was it wasn't glacial. It was gin clear. So you could see all the fish. And most of them are glacial, you know, so they, yeah. they've got that. Yeah, real kind of, milky. Wow, well, yeah. And we caught fish, you just like as many as you want. And it was, you know, you don't want to do that a lot, right? But yeah. it was Get bored. special. And I wrote this piece about it. There was a guy, Nick, who was the float plane pilot, who was a great guy. And we just had so much fun on that trip. And I thought, you know, I got over my little hissy fit about not getting on the Dean. Um, he had a place called Moose Lake Lodge. Yeah. You know that place? Of course, been and there. And we stayed, ah, yeah. oh, magic. Just, just a magic place. And and then a year later, John phoned me up and he said, do you want to fish the Dean? And he and he, he paid for everything. He said, you did such a great job. And, you know, it was very complimentary about the pictures. And I got articles in half a dozen magazines. And I fished the Dean. And I met like a who's who of, of, of steelheaders. You weren't there, but there were a bunch of people you'll know coming off the water when I arrived. Definitely. And it was Nick, the same guy who flew me up there. So there was George Cook. You ever yep. know George Cook? Yep. There was Mo Purvis. There was like, it was like all these the rock Dean stars. crew, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, how was it? And 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 Bo Purvis said to him, well, we got six. And I said, but you got six. And he said, no, we got six. And George Cook said to me, they're either late or they're not coming this year. That was 2005, which okay. was one of the worst years ever mm-hmm. on the Dean. And I was like, and George Cook pulled me aside and he didn't know me from Adam. He said, Dredge. He said, whatever the guides tell you, ignore all of that. He said, fish a big intruder and dredge and lose flies. If you're not losing flies, you're not, you're not down there. And Dave Chamberlain, who was my guide, who I'd love to know where Dave is because he was, we never, in the UK, Skagit's were, in Europe, Skagit lines were not a thing then. Yeah. And the first thing he was like, what's that line? Because I was trying to throw these great big, you know, those big intruders with a Scandi line, which is not easy because you can't boss them like you can with a Scandi. So Dave was like, come here. And he gave me his reel with a Skagit, like the original Rio Skagit, which is like rope. I mean, it's no taper. It's just like this. And I was like, what the fuck is this thing? You know, it was because it lands like a ton of bricks, but it would pop one of those big intruders straight across the river. And I and, and not, when I came home, I was like the king of the world. I went to Russia with some buddies to a river called the Varzina, and I was the only one with a skagit. No one knew what it was. And I just was the king of the world because we fish a fly called a snelder. You know, snelder? Yeah. Snelder's an Icelandic tube fly. It's heavy, big, heavy fly. And with a scandy line, it's a bitch. You know, you're thrashing away like an idiot trying to. But with a, with a skagit, and I went to the Varzina when it's high, and I was with a buddy, Mark, and I just kicked his ass, which if, if you know Mark, that is a very, <laughs> it's a really lovely <laughs> experience. And he can really fish, but he couldn't throw, you know, two snelders. So that's two inches of brass tubing, you know, with a scandy line because it's difficult. But with yeah. a skadget, he's popping out and he's like, what are you, how are you doing that? Anyway, I, co- I got there. The Dean was a disaster. There were six of us at the lodge. By the fourth day, four of the guys who were kind of high rollers from New York said, we want to go home. No one had <gasps> caught fish, seen a fish. And I was like, no, no, no. And they said, do you want to come? Because we're going to charter the plane out. No. I said, no way. And on the fifth day, so the other guy was a lovely guy. He was quite an old guy. And Dave was kind of looking after him. He could see I was, you know, younger and fitter and so on. I could wait a bit more. So Dave put me in the cut bank. And he said, we're going to be down just down the way. Um, 
and he gave me a radio and said, if you get fish, give me a shout. And I saw a fish come into the pool and I fished down, I was halfway down the cut bank and I caught it. And it was a beautiful, it was a cry, it was a steelhead where the fins are transparent, right? Yep. So you could see your hand right through the tail. But it didn't fight. It, it came in like a sack. What? And I got it in. I was like, well, what's all the big deal with these things? So I made like a, I created like a puddle and I put it in the puddle. So oh, it was underwater. God. And I took a picture. Okay. Was, yeah, that was cool. It was a deep puddle. <laughs> it went back just fine. Don't start. <laughs> I remember that fish, the back of your place, and you didn't even let me take a picture of it. And I caught a lovely fish. You remember that? And you're like, no, it's good. <laughs> and it was gone. <laughs> and no, and I, I honestly admire you for that. I, I so wanted a picture of that fish. But anyway. Get it back in the water. Get it back in the water. But exactly. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, I got a quick picture, and it was a quick picture. The radio, the batteries had run out on the radio, which was, you know, Dave was cool, but Dave's the sort of guy whose batteries had run out. Um, and then he came up the river an hour later uh, to move me to another spot. And I said, I got one. And he was like, he was, he was happier than I was because he could see I'd come all this way and, I, you know, I'd – Come the year before, and I couldn't fish, and it, the fishing was good the year before. And he said, "How did it fight?" And I said, "I said you people need to get out more because if you reckon that's the hardest fighting fish in the world." And he said, "No, come on." And I said, "No, I just came in." And he was like, "Well, sometimes because it's before the canyon, isn't it? The canyon's upstream or downstream." Yes, yeah, before the canyon, they usually turn yeah. around and rip straight back to the ocean. Exactly, exactly. And I was like, and I was giving giving out. You know, I like to give out to people sometimes. So I'm like, what's all the big deal? And there was all the salmon and the steelhead. Da, da, da. So anyway, the next day he put me back in the cut bank. It was the last day, and took the other guy off. They he fished the other guy fished the cut bank first, and there's another place called the meat hole down in the corner. Mm -hmm. You know that spot where mm -hmm. you go around the corner, and he fished. I fished that one first, and then in the afternoon I fished the cut bank. And I had a run in with a bear on that big high bank. Mm -hmm. I went up to take a day, nearly, nearly, nearly trod on a grizzly bear. Anyway, fished down, same spot. I hooked another fish, and that was what the Dean River fish are all about. Oh, thank goodness! Okay, off. and it was like it was in the air more than it was in the water. It was, yes. it was like skipping a stone. I mean, it was just gone, and it took me all the way down to the end of the cut bank. It wasn't, it was like 15 pounds, I reckon. It wasn't like freaky big. Um, I think it was a hen fish. So yeah. Dave said the same, but it, it had that blunt nose thing on it. Uh that now that that was smart. And it came off. So, but that was smart. And then I said, All right, Dave, Dave, I take it all back because that is, you know, and because they're fresh there, right? And any fresh fish, that that fish was red hot. That was an amazing experience. So oh, I'm so happy you got to go back. Yeah, yeah, I was, it was, and I loved the Dean. And when, so when I met you and Charles, and then I saw you on the Dean, and I was like, if she's getting Charles on the Dean, she's pretty keen on Charles, right? I had Charles. one space left because I had been booked out. I was on a, I had people on a wait list and I had just right. one yeah, space because it was the last week of Chinook before we transitioned into Steelhead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, and I, I was obviously keen on him. And I was like, if you'd like this spot, you're you obviously can have keen it. on him, isn't that right? <laughs> And he didn't know. And it was quite, I mean, that is quite charming about Charles because Charles is a prankster and he's, you know, he's, he likes Trouble. to fool around. We had so much fun. That In my book, there's a picture of that. Remember that little gapper hook hut that we used to sit in and get yeah. drunk and fool around? That, so there's a picture of Pear. You remember Pear Arneberg? Of course. And and Margot sitting in there. And I rigged the whole shot. So I put the camera because I could see, I've got to get a picture of that place because it's like the quintessential Norwegian. Because Norwegian salmon fishing isn't just about the fish, right? It's about the whole experience. Like, drinking all night and fishing down the pool and then drinking some more and, you know, frying Not some sleeping and more not sleeping. Yeah, yep. yeah, 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 exactly. And there's a shot that I love of, of Pear and Margot sitting in that same hut that you and I and, and Charles and a bunch of them. Um, yeah, he's a lovely guy. He was the guy, he guided Charles. I'm trying to remember his name. Charles played. Um, oh, Daniel. Daniel Pearson. Yeah, yeah. And and all of them, they're great people. I mean, and I. so what I did was I couldn't make a picture of it. I was scratching my head and then I realized that you've got to get elevation. So you see the fire and the hut and the whole with the river in the background. So I, put the camera on a on a pole that was like 15 feet in the air and there's this lovely shot one of my favorite pictures and pear's really hamming it up you know i was like pear 
come on. So he's going, it was that big. And but Margot's laughing because he's such a crummy actor. You know, he's really overdoing it, which makes it work, right? Because it's like she's laughing at it's nonsense that it was this big. And I just love that shot. And it brings all that. I mean, that was such a special week that week. It really you know? was. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it is all about. I mean, I, I wrote this in a book. I think all the people that I've met with, and you have, you know, from fly fishing, from all over the world, you know, that you would never, I've got friends in like from the tundra of Northern Russia and and some fly blown little port in Cuba. And, you know, you wouldn't meet any of those people in, in everyday life, you know, so. And you certainly cool. wouldn't that connect was, the way that you do. No, that's right. That's right. And the humor, you know, I mean, the Cuban guy, you fished in Cuba, right? No, not sure. yet. I know. Well, I've heard. Go and you've got to fish. I mean, the, the thing is, like the the first generation guides, a lot of them are retiring. You know, they've been doing that job twenty five years, and they were all they were turtle fishermen. I mean, Koki is one of the best guides I've ever fished with anywhere. He's this little hot headed. You've got to fish with Koki before he retires. I mean, Koki is, he's so rude. He's like extra, but he's brilliant. He's so brilliant that you kind of got to, you've got to kind of um, excuse his rudeness, forgive his rudeness, you know, right. but he, I love him to bits. He used to go in with his dad and catch turtles and sell them in the village for food. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like sea turtles. Yeah, yeah. Big turtles. And, you know, I mean, you know, we don't, don't judge, right? I hear what you're no, saying. No, no, like, no, I'm just listening. Turtles. Yeah, but but that was his job. And yeah. now he's wearing, you know, Costa del Mar shades and, you know, and he's got some funky little permit sort of necklace on and, you know, and and, and Van Star pliers and he's, and he's a rock star, you know. And and those guys are like some of the rich, they're like prize fighters in Cuba, you know, where, where a taxi driver earns more than a doctor. They are absolute rock stars. But he is, I love him to bits. I, lo- I took, so him, Bemba, Pedrito is this big bear of a guy. I mean, they're just wonderful people. And I just think, how would some kid from some crummy suburb of West London ever get to know those people? You know, that's the real, to me, that's the real joy of the travel. I mean, the fishing's great. Don't get me wrong. I love the fishing. But to meet all these people, and I get, I, you know, I, I'm I, none of us get on with everyone. You know, I fall out with people like it. We all do. But but to meet those people, you know, and and Vovo, who, who's my guide on the Akanga, you know, I just love him. And and to, I mean, I still chat to him, but I just dread him. You know, he could get conscripted to go and have to fight in Ukraine, which is is just all wrong because he's the most gentle, lovely man. He saved my life. I fell in the river, and he definitely saved my life. So what do you, you know, how was he in a boat? He made a fire. He made a fire. I don't know how he made a fire, but oh, I you're fell freezing. in. Freezing, right? But I I had hypothermia. And it's I'm quite hazy about what happened, but he wouldn't let me go to sleep. So I wanted to curl up in a ball, which is like what you do when you've got hypothermia. Um, and he just kicked kicking me, which is very vocal. He doesn't he didn't give you a polite tap on the shoulder, he just kick you while and making a fire on the tundra is quite complicated because there's nothing to make a fire with. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how he did it, but but I just love that guy to bits, you know. And and I and I really hope that. You know that, that I get to see him again because because what's happening in Russia? I don't when we're going to go back to Russia, but but and I really miss it. I really miss it. It was, you know, that's the last real big wilderness in in Europe, and mm. uh, you know you go there. I mean, you but when you fly out in that helicopter, there's nothing. There's no roads. There's nothing for two hundred miles. You know, so hopefully we'll get back there one day. But uh, now, the book, it. have you put all these stories in the book? Tell me, we've referenced yeah. the book a couple of times yes. or a number of times, and I'd yes. like to hear more about it. Tell us all about the book. This is, all right. I want all right. people to rush out and buy it. So tell yeah, us all buy the about book. it. Buy the book. What book? Uh, so my book's called The Fish of a Lifetime. Um, and for a long time, people used to say to me, oh, you should do a book. And you're like, when am I ever going to do a book? Right? A book's a big number, right? And then COVID happened. When COVID happened, I was like, right, I can't photograph any kids. I can't photograph any fishing. I can't go fishing. What am I? And I thought, the book, I'll do the book. And it was like a lit, I was lying in bed at three in the morning. So I, as you get older, you're going to find April, you sleep less. Right. So I often wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning. And I used to just lie there and think about stuff. And sometimes it's happy stuff or bright ideas, but sometimes you're all chewed up about something. But more and more, I thought, get up. Get up and use the energy. Don't just lie here. 
and I woke up at three o'clock one more, literally three o'clock in the morning. Um, and I thought I could do a book. I could now is the time to do a book. And I got up and I just started scribbling stuff down. And I've got a buddy, David Pierce, who's a very famous graphic designer in the UK. Um, he's like, I mean, he's like Jimi Hendrix of graphic design in the in the UK. And he'd always said to me, do a book. So I got in touch with him and he said, yeah, I'll help you out with it and mates rates and stuff, you know, do it. And he designed, like he said, I'll design one chapter and you tell me what you think. And he came back and bear in mind, this guy worked for uh, Pentagram, who are like world famous as a graphic design studio in London. And then he worked for Tatham Pierce, which is his own David Pierce, Tatham Pierce, so his own company. And he came back with these, with these designs and... I hope he's not listening. He knows this already. I didn't like them. I was like, how do I tell him? This guy's like a rock star, you know? But they just weren't what I, you know, you get that idea in your head. And I phoned him and I was like, yeah. And he said, he, he's bright, you know, he's super, he's retired. Uh, and he's been around the block and he said, you don't like them. And I was like, no. And he said, no, you don't like them. Just say you don't like them. Just don't pussy around. Just say you don't. So I said, uh, okay, he said, I'll do I'll do five different designs. So he did. And they came back and I didn't like any of those either. And it's not because David is not a great designer. It's because I'd got it in my head what it was going to look like. So I did a graphic design degree uh, about 300 years ago. So I know roughly how to design something. So I thought, why don't I do it myself? So I kind of did it roughly, kind of sketched it out on Photoshop, which is not really what you use to design stuff. And then I took it down to my good lady wife, Kath, who got a first class honours degree in fine art, right? So she knows what what looks good. And I'm the living proof, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at them and I said, which one do you like? And she went straight to my one, straight to it. She said that one. And then I've got a buddy, Murdo, who's a, he's a Scottish guy, he's an illustrator. And I sent email, he went straight to mine. And I, you know, if David's listening, this is not because David's designs were not good. It was because I had such a strong you knew what you idea yeah. of how I wanted it. So I thought, so I wrote to David, I said, look, don't take this the wrong way. I'm really grateful. You know, I laid it on thick and I said, but I want to do it myself. And um, and he was fine. He's very great, very English, you know. He's like, that's fine and great. And da, 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 da. You never know what the English are thinking because they always say, that's fine, you know, even if they absolutely hate you for something. So I, because it was COVID, I got on YouTube and there was a Kiwi guy doing one of these YouTube tutorials on a thing called InDesign, which is how you actually design. And I watched that thing for two weeks and I just studied it and followed it. And it's, you know, as you get older, it's harder to learn new tricks as the saying goes. But I, I, I'd say after I'd watched it for three or four days, I'd say, right, let's see what happens when I try and design. Because once you've designed one chapter, you can do, you've done all of it, right? Because mm. it's just, and I thought this isn't so difficult. And then I got a publisher who had a, a design, they had their own designer who just looked it over and said, yeah, that'll print. And he, you know, pulled a few things around and said, you need to do X, Y, and Z. But mainly I designed it and I'd done all of it. So I edited it, wrote it, photographed it, designed it. And um, and then there was a slip up. I'm not going to point new fingers, but it was a slip up. So it, it, we missed the print window. And finally, we just about managed, because you really want to print these things for Christmas, right? So they want to come out October time mm -hmm. because everyone's thinking, well, what shall I get, you know, dear old Uncle Johnny or or, or Auntie Janice, uh, who's a keen fly fisherman. Um, what am I going to get them for Christmas? And the books, I mean, it's it's a big book. It's a it weighs nine pounds, right? Oh my God! Okay, it's, it's a big out. beast of a thing. And I agonised about it. I thought I could do two two books, like warm water, cold water, and then you think, no, nah, more people are who's going to buy the warm water one? You know, in the UK. And so I made it into one massive great book. So stay there. I don't think it'll translate on the podcast, but look, there's the oh. book. Well, oh it's my goodness! Beast. Gorgeous, it though. Is. Look at that. And it's heavy. It's heavy. And it's probably a little bit, a little bit cumbersome, but it had to be comprehensive, right? It had to be everywhere I'd been that made the cut. So there's like 42 different destinations in there. 
What do you um, cover in each didn't... destination? You've obviously got stories. Do you cover any? Yeah, so they're all they're all like ripping yarns. And 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 the thing that I really loved when so I did it, got selling it, and we had some headaches with it. I took over complete control of it because and you can see I'm a bit of a control freak. So I took over control from one of the best designers. I bought the stock out from the publisher. I bought all of the so I own all the stock. Oh I own gosh. The, the intellectual property rights. So I'm I'm just that I want it the way I want it, you know, because I've been self-employed Fair. since yeah. I was 21. So I know what that comes from, you know, that I'm used to being in charge of and when someone else is involved, you're like, no, 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 I want it like this. So then it's a you you're like that. I know that. You, I, you I love it. Own, so yeah. is it for sale on Amazon? Can you buy it on Amazon? Yeah, you can, but we've had you can buy it on Amazon, but don't because then I lose 15%. You could no, I'm happy that we're talking about this. This needs to be spent, and I, you know, I am gonna send you you and Charles as a very belated wedding present. Well, you got a wedding present, which is my photography, but yeah, I'm gonna send you a copy um as soon as we stop talking, which will arrive hopefully very, very soon. Um and you're gonna laugh when you read the chapter, which is called My Kind of Wedding. And it's all it celebrates your wedding, but it doesn't mention you or Charles by name, but anyone will know you know, reading it. Um, and it's all about fishing with Jimmy, Jimmy Allen up there. Cause, cause when you said come to the, my photograph of wedding, it was like, like, that's a long way to go. Right. <laughs> but I thought, no, I do the right thing. And then you absolutely know it. Cause you said still it'll be in. And I was like, well, then you said, yeah. And they were, and the fishing, I had a day with Jimmy. I don't know if you even know this cause, cause you would have been busy with a, a million things, but Jimmy Allen and Rob Nicholson, Charles is best man i think um yeah. yeah so jimmy took us down to the potato patch on the kiss box mm-hmm. and i went upstream and there was like a flat there with a load of pink salmon spawning right loads of pink salmon yeah on a flat it's a big wide flat it's a little way up from the potato patch so they went down and jimmy could see me so they were fishing this really nice run and i was i was just watching these pink salmon spawning and then i saw the eggs coming down because you know they're quite messy so you see the eggs and I saw a steelhead come up and eat an egg. I absolutely swear. And you know, people say, oh, they don't eat once they're in the river. No, they well, do. Yeah, they absolutely do. And I've seen that. I've seen them eating sculpins on the Damda Chacks and lots of different stuff. So anyway, I thought, okay, egg sucking leech, put it on, boom, fish. And I, the way I fish an egg sucking leech, I get a woolly bugger and I'd slide a bead on the front. And then I got another one and then they, they dried up and I thought, I wonder if I take the leech off, just fish the feed. <laughs> and then it was every cast. And Jimmy came out. Rob was pissed because Rob was like, just watching me go, oh, I'd say, it's all right, Jimmy, I'm good. And I was just slaying me still head for fun. And Jimmy came out and, and I was like, am I okay doing this with just the egg bead? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I do it all the time, but don't oh, no. tell anyone. So <laughs> edit that bit out. <laughs> I, I can't edit it out. Different <laughs> different Jimmy Allen, different Jimmy Allen. Yeah, it was another Jimmy <laughs> Allen, but. But I love Jimmy to bits and I love that whole family to bits because we did a shoot there with Andy Mill. You ever met Andy Mill? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So Andy, it was, God, it was so funny. So we did a shoot for Mary Jim who make sunglasses. And the the art director, who was the he was a frame designer for Mary Jim. And he said, I want to shoot this ad and I want you to shoot Andy Mill fishing. So I was like, okay. He said, we're going to go steelhead fishing. And I was like, Andy Mill steelhead fishing, and I was like, "Well, the tarpon, Andy, right?" Yeah. Well, I guess and trout, but yes. In the sun, well, not much. I mean, so I was like, "There's sunglasses," and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, but it, we'll go steelhead fishing." And I was like, "Well, why don't we go saltwater sight fishing?" And I don't think Richard beat me up if he hears me say this. I don't think Richard figured out that in the southern hemisphere. It's summertime in the winter here, right? Because <laughs> he was like, no, no, but it's winter. And I was like, yeah, we could go to the Seychelles. We go like, you know, and I'm thinking this is going to be a great gig. But Rich, I I know now, Rich, who's a lovely guy, he wanted to go steelhead fishing. He got it into his head. We're going, to, and nothing was going to. So I went with Andy, and Andy couldn't spay cast. He didn't want to spay. He, Andy's top. And I mean, he, I, I know Andy and, and Nikki's kid. I haven't seen them for a long time now, but. Nicky would always say, what are those Dorado? Like, you know, he wanted to know about bumphead parrot fish, all the crazy stuff that, you know, that I've been lucky enough to do. And and Andy is like a religious seller. It's like, come away from him. You know, I don't want him leading you from the 
path of top and righteousness, you know. <laughs> you know, and then Nikki would skeech up and say, Are those Dorado pretty cool? I'm like, yeah, they're really cool. <laughs> you know? But Andy is he is tarpon and tarpon, and that's it. You know, that's his thing. And hats off to him, and he's the best. He is the best. And watching him car, I don't know if you've ever been in a skiff with him, but no. it is an education. It is an absolute education, and hats off to him. But and they got Andy out there because he was an ambassador for Maori Jim. And he's thrashing away with his spay rod. And Jimmy's like, Jimmy's a great cast. You know, Jimmy Allen, he's like yeah. a ninja. So Jimmy's like watching Andy thrashing around. And the fishing was loud. We had a big cold snow. It was too late. It was really, we went up on the kiss beyond. And the water was really, you know, they just go, when it's that cold, they just sit down. There were fish in the river. Um, but finally we got some. Um you know, we got the pictures in the can and Andy mugged up and he's a pro, you know, you look and he did a speech about it, great fish, but I'm probably going to get into trouble. But he does not give a stuff about anything. Steelhead, salmon, uh, it's got to be a top. And we used to go in the truck at dawn because I was always like, we want to be out when the lights, you know, early for the pictures. And we'd be in that truck and everyone's a bit kind of bleary eyed, maybe a bit hung over. And Andy was just talking about tarpon. You know, and and I could catch Jimmy Allen's eye in the rearview mirror, and he's like, you know, he's like, when's this guy going to shut up about those bloody tarpon? You know, <laughs> and I just, I just, and when Andy went, so Andy had to go home the day before I did, and Jimmy was, he said, come fishing for the day. He said, just come fishing, and I uh, fished with Brian Skerritt. Do you know Brian? Brian was a guide then. Uh, this is going back. This is I've got a, I've got a weird memory for names, and I remember Brian. And Donnie, I don't know if you know Donnie. Donnie's still there, yeah. Yeah, so we all went out fishing, and I caught, I think, I definitely caught one, and it was hot. That was a hot fish. Um, and I just thought steelhead are really cool. And I wish Andy had had that experience, because I think, I mean, he the fish he got were, didn't fight hard. They, I mean, they'd like, st and salmon are the same. You know, when when you get one that's been through rapid and it's come bombing mm -hmm. up the river, you get a tired one, it's tired, right? But, yeah. but I got a really hot fish with Brian, and that was like, you know, steelhead are, are cool. So, and 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 you know, it was great to. I haven't seen, I haven't seen, I haven't seen any of those guys since your wedding, which is a long time ago now. So, yeah. it's long overdue. I mean, I you know, I did. I've I've got to say, April, I did want to see it all. You know, um, I wanted to see the bump head parrot fish, and I wanted to see the rooster fish, and the, um, but and I'm trying to do volume two of the book. Um, so the books, you know, I'll tell you very quickly. I went to. Brazil to fish for peacocks last year with a guy called Paddy Berger, who's a soccer player, very famous soccer player in Europe from the Czech Republic. And Paddy played for Liverpool, which is one of the biggest teams in England um, for eight years and was a, like a superstar, world, world superstar. And Paddy loves to fly fish. And I said, come on, I'll take, I'll show you the jungle, right? Not just the fishing, but the, you know, the whole deal. And we went there and my book was being printed. But it hadn't been printed. So I'd been to see it on the press, but it hadn't been bound, right? So it'd been the pages had been printed. And I was really hoping that I'd be able to take a copy and show Rod Salas and Marcelo. But anyway, it didn't get bound in time. Um, but I had it on my laptop. So we got to Rio Mario, Peacock Bass Fishing, and there's all these guys, these American guys. And one of them said, nice, really nice guys. He said, are you the guy who's doing that big book? Because I've done some like pre-publicity for it. And he said, have you got a copy? And I said, well, I haven't, but I've got it on my laptop. So they all gathered around and looked at every page on the laptop. And they're all ooing and ahhing and what the hell's that fish? And where's that? And da 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 And then we got to the end of the book and one guy said, he said, uh, where's the striped bass? And I was like, uh, and he said, where do you think we're from? And I said, I've got a good idea. Uh, Cape Cod? And he said, yeah, we're all, which is like striped bass central. And they all mugged up like they were super pissed off that I'd insulted them by not. And I turned to the front page and I went, volume one? <laughs> in this little squeaky voice. <laughs> I said, I'll be in the next one. And they're like, yeah, all right. And then by the end of the trip, they were saying, you come stay at my house and we'll take you to Monomoy and, you know, all the um so so striped bass will be in volume two as will lots of other things i have because you can do a volume two of course no, it's what's, volume one's on the front cover it says what's the book was, called by the way because we haven't covered that the, uh, it's called the fish of a life oh that's right you said that the fish of a lifetime right? and then just yeah. also shameless uh, plug where could the fish of a lifetime by matt <laughs> yeah. harris and where yeah. can they buy it 
how much is they can it? buy it at www.thefishforlifetime.com and um it must be I, a I mean, fortune i mean it's a huge book it would have it would have cost quid. a fortune it's a hundred quid um which is about 120 dollars us okay um, that's about right for a book that size i think so i yeah. mean i've sold plenty of them yeah. um so so that's good it costs a lot to produce and i'm you know i'm not going to apologize for the price because no. the brits the, it, I found the Americans, the Canadians, most of the Europeans, they like they don't quibble. The Brits are all like, that's a lot for a book. And I'm like, well, don't buy the book. I get really tested because I know what went into that book, but also how much it costs to produce it. Yeah. You know, it costs a lot of money to produce it. Because if it's going to be good, you know, it's like your life's work. It's got to look beautiful. You can't print it on some second rate shitty paper, you know, or 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 cut any corners. So no, I don't, I don't apologize for it. And I, and I'm proud of it. You know, it's it's got it's got my kind of heart and soul in it, you know. I mean, it's got stuff that. And the one thing is, when you tell stories, like everyone knows me as a photographer, but Tom, do you know Tom By from the Drake? Yeah, yeah. So Tom wrote something really. I've never met Tom, but he wrote some really nice things about the book. And the thing that really got me was he said that he he said the writing's great, and a few and, other. And, and that, that means a lot coming from Tom. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Um, and that, you know, because everyone says, oh, you're a photographer. And I really want people to read it, you know, not just look at the pictures. Because I think a lot of us, I think in this day and age, it's ve we're very, you know, this kind of instant gratification thing. We're like, oh, yeah, lovely pictures done. But, you know, there's a lot of stories that I'm really fond of. You know, I mean, there's, like that chapter about Craig, you know, that's like a love letter. I mean, it was like, I get the wrong idea. I mean, I can remember I caught a 12 pound brown trout with Craig and I hugged him and he was like, yeah, get off, will you? <laughs> you know, and he, so if I, he heard me talking about some love letter to him, he would not be best Smack with you. But he was a gem, you know, and it's all in there. And you can tell from that story that, you know, I loved him to bits and, and, you know, and I look back and I think, that's like a testament to who he was. He's just a brilliant guy, but just a great guy, you know, great person to spend time with. So, and there's a lot of, there's, it's difficult to write funny stories. So there's lots of funny stuff that's happened to me and I'm sure you on trips. I think and, of you as a, as a storyteller with lots of comedic talent. I, I want to read yeah. what you have to say. I mean, the photos yeah. will be great. Will. I want you to will. read what you have to say. Yeah, You will, you will. It's on its way. Uh, and I'd love to hear what you think of that. Cause I really, when I wrote, I wrote the story about your wedding, and I remember at the time I thought this is a private thing, and I really want to hear what you think of it because it's it's like it pokes a bit of fun at Charles, you know, which is as it should be. Um, but yeah, tell me what you think. So I'm going to send you the book, and you can you can tell me what you yeah, and you'll know, you know, you'll 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 know a lot of the references. And I mean that that day we went out when I caught those fish on the dry fly, I mean that's one of the great days, and and we were all hammered. I think. Yeah, I think I listened to you talking to Hank Patterson, or or I I don't know what Hank's real name is. Yeah, Travis, but um, yes, Hank. Travis, yeah, I think he turned up just after your wedding. Is that right? Yeah, came right in yes. after. Yeah, yeah. And you can and always tell by looking at photos of Charles because Charles, you dipshits, all of you guys, you let him eat a hot dog on a hot skewer. You know, over the fire, you guys are roasting hot dogs on yeah, yeah, on yeah. sticks. And so yeah. twice, not once, but twice, he went to eat the hot dog off the, off the hot metal and poked himself in the lip. So he got married with these big marks on his lip from <laughs> eating hot hot dogs with you guys. Oh, you yeah, guys cannot be left I unattended, mean, I swear. I he's very good looking, but he's not the sharpest <laughs> tool in the box. <laughs> Although, one of my great memories of that trip we did to Norway was when we were making s'mores. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. So... I mean, I didn't know what a schmore was, and you're all poking fun at me because I pronounced it schmore. Schmore, yeah. but yes. And you're like, no, no, how do you pronounce it? S'more. S'more. Okay, so I'm schmore. I'm not Jewish. Or you're schmore. Anyway, so I was, <laughs> and that was all a big joke. And then, so we're all sitting around this pair, and Daniel Pearson, and I don't think Charles was there. I've got a picture of it happening. And... I can remember two times you got the giggles really bad. And yeah. one time was when I was doing the Donald Duck thing when you were in that, you remember that bridge pool, that famous pool with that yeah. little kind of mountain in the background. And the other time was when we were making s'mores. Well, that's right. right. Yeah, Charles and was not there. It was just all of Charles us. Charles wasn't there. Pear was there. And I yeah. think Dan Pearson was there and some of the other, and they were all good. You remember, it's like a great crowd. And your marsh, so s'mores for anyone listening who doesn't know it's basically a marshmallow on a stick right 
uh-huh. and you toast it, and then you put it between two graham crackers. Correct. Is that it? Yeah, with chocolate. The the with marshmallow chocolate. has to melt the chocolate. But now you, <laughs> your marshmallow caught fire. <laughs> And I don't think, I don't know if you've made s'mores before, but you were really not very good at it. So you started shaking a stick to get this thing off. And it's, it's like napalm. I mean, it's like this lava. Red marshmallow lava's flying around. And, like, and you're like, this thing's on fire. And then you suddenly realize like, the entire crew is lying flat on the floor while you're flinging this kind of molten marshmallow lava around, you know. <laughs> it was, I think you have a photo of the aftermath. I I've do. got a photo with the I black. Do, and I'm, I'm going to put it up post, on Instagram. I'll post these photos. These are too good. Yeah, yeah. I always remember that. But that was, you know, that was that was just a great trip. And I also remember seeing you on a subsequent trip there when you were very pregnant with Adelaide. Yeah. And you were going off marlin fishing. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Because I bought Charles a trip to Russia. And, yeah, and then I was not going on a, and you a were like, different right, trip. So you guys. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we did a like, swap out. We well, we met briefly in Norway and then he yeah, went his way and I went my way. That's right. And Mark, so Charles went to Yukanga and you went, Mark, and I was like being dad, like sort of mansplaining to you. You really shouldn't be marlin fishing when you're like eight months pregnant because you were like out <laughs> Yeah. And I can remember you like, yeah, stick it in your ear, granddad. You know? And you went, right? I'm sure yeah, you went. I went to Christmas you? Island and then I was supposed to go to Russia. And then there were a few other trips. And then, yeah, it got to the point. So I, I hunted and fished till I was eight and a half months pregnant. And finally, my doctor was that person. And she said, look, you're yeah. at this rate, you're going to give Jeez. birth in the field. So you should probably take this next two weeks to chill, <laughs> which I did. I did. But <laughs> I thought well, my life was right. going to be over ha- after having a baby, but didn't. Work out no, that but way. it's not right. No. Well, I mean, you know, I and I know that. So when I went traveling with my kids, you know, I realized. I mean, it, it's it's different. It's not easy, but it's doable. And that's the best year of my life, without any doubt. Really? You know? Yeah, without any doubt, because I got to know my kids and and fell in love with them. You know, and 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 I, I took my so I got three boys, and they're all in their twenties now. And the middle one, Tom, is is always. He's been, and I hope he listens to this. He was always the difficult one. He was a right little git, right? So he was, he's, he's, um, he had ADHD, you know, um, and he was a difficult bugger. And, you know, when you turn the internet off at 10 o'clock at night, he was like a volcano, you know, and it was was difficult times. And then I had this idea to take him on a trip. I took, I've taken them all on trips, but I took, so I took Charlie to Alaska. We went to, um, no see him on the Quijack. Mm-hmm. Had a great time. But I could see Charlie didn't fall in love with fishing because they like instant, like I was saying, instant gratification. I was like, that's cool, you know. And then I thought, where am I going to take Tom? And I took Tom to Jardinus Lorena in, in Cuba because Tom is a master. He's got a Paddy Master Diver Certificate. Right. And they've always told me it's the best diving. I mean, there's a guy, David Dubelay, do you know his stuff? David Dubai was the yeah he was the National Geographic diving photographer for he may still be really right. amazing photographer really amazing I mean doesn't matter what your photography thing is whether you photograph babies or fishing his pictures of the underwater and split level are amazing and he said that Jardina Slorena is the best diving he's ever experienced so I thought let's do it so I said to Tom I will learn to dive if you learn to fly fish. And Tom was this 17 year old. Uh, he's sexy. He looks like Robert Plant. He's got this big mop of hair. He's got a big, sexy barrel chest, you know. And, the, you know, he's got a lovely girlfriend, Meg, who's probably saying, shut up. <laughs> but he was difficult. You know, he was really, really hated school. Like a lot of kids, a lot of bright kids. He's super bright. But he hated being chained to a desk, you know, and sitting listening to teacher all day. So I said, right. Come to Cuba for a week in the Easter holidays, or no, summer holiday. And I went and learned to dive, which was really scary. Can you scuba dive? Yeah, I did it, but I don't like it. No, I scared the wits out of me. But I did it. I was the only one who, I did a crash course over yep. four days. Got my paddy. Everyone failed. I had a real scare when my I was buddied up with a guy. And when they turn your regular, you know, they turn your regulator off when you least expect it. And you have to do the signal to say give me your regulator and the guy I was with just freaked out and swam away what and so I was 
So I had three big gulps of water in my lungs. And I just, I had nightmares for months afterwards, months. Because you you think you're going to die. I mean, your body's saying no. And, and, and you're 10 meters down, so you can't swim for the top because you're going to get decompression sickness. And the, and the um the instructor was a bit slow off the blocks, but anyway, and because when so the instructor gave me his regulator, and then you have to force all the water th- in your lungs back through the regulator before you can breathe. So it's pretty pretty sketchy. Anyway, I got over that. I passed. Tom did about ten minutes fly fishing and said he could do it. You know, <laughs> which is very like Tom. But we went to Jardin Lorena, and I got Koki, the guy was talking this little hothead firecracker and he was i mean to this day i thank Koki because if you saw Ko- Koki can be so rude i took a swedish guy ulla who's a spay fisherman never fished in a single handed rod and Koki just systematically beat him up so ulla would cast you know he's just not used to using a single handed rod and he cast and Koki comes out with all these smart ass remarks so he says please sir and he talks in this like mexican bandit he says please sir cast to the front of the fish the head is in the front of the fish. The mouth is in the head. <laughs> you know, it's like comedy. And all is like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's who you're dealing with. But when he saw that Tom was brand new, he just, and I said, this is my son, Koki. I want you to teach him. And he was a different person. None, none of that stuff, which I quite enjoy, you know, as long as you're not on the end of it. Yeah. Um, but he, um, he, he taught Tom to fly fish and Tom caught bone fish. You know, he didn't, he didn't fall in love with fishing, but the trip, he fell in love with the trip, you know, and we, and I did some mad stuff. I swam around with a big caiman and took pictures right up close. Oh, cool. And Tom was like, you could see, yeah. And Tom was like, my dad's cool, you know, and it broke. We had such a terrible relationship, April, you know, he was 17, you know, a lot of 17 year old boys have issues as I did, you know, and, you know, authority issues. And one night we were sitting on the back deck and he and I was smoking a cigar. I don't, I don't even like cigars, but you're in Cuba, right? So I was smoking a stupid, great Robusto <laughs> with a big mojito. And Tom said, can I have one? And I was like, if you want. So he sat there and said, yeah, why does anyone do this? But we smoked them anyway because we and we had a big mojito. We really had about a dozen big mojitos. And he said, Dad, is this what you do for a living? And I was like, pretty much. <laughs> and and it gave him the bug. And then the next thing he was doing, a diving course in Costa Rica. Then he was doing, uh, where else did he go? The Bahamas. And now he's knuckled down. He's So he, he is doing a degree in, he's basically learning to be, um, he, he's in a medical, like a surgery, you know, um, surgical theater, um, doing everything except chopping people open. So he may become wow. an anesthetist. So if you knew, if you saw his school record, april from 10 years ago it was like i mean it was a bad joke but i think that changed his life i really do and it definitely whatever else it did it changed my relationship with him you know and now i mean we still joust around and we you know the, of my three boys he's the most like me i love them all to pieces um but he's the one who reminds me of myself at that age you know cocky you know mouthy pain in the arts all that stuff um but but that really that was such a you know i'm so grateful to the guys at avalon you know because they comp that trip i mean i shot a lot of pictures and put articles in magazines and da, 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 da. but that was a life-changing trip so happy days oh, you've got all that to come how old's adelaide now six just turned okay. six yep. yeah and she looks I mean, she looks like a wild thing. To She's me. absolutely. I tell people it's like having a drunken eighteen-year-old in college with you at all times. Yeah. So it's never a dull moment. She is an yeah. absolute wild animal. Yeah. She's good. a party, but we love her. So I mean, I'm ready for it. Yeah, I'm yeah. ready for it. Trying really, to stay young and really. stay on top of it. Yeah, um, yeah. When do we get to see you again? Um, I would like to say that as soon as possible. I, I don't hope mean so. That. Uh, it's yeah. been far too long. And you know, I love both of you to bits. And I, you know, I I've always had a bit of a man crusher in Charles. Charles is funny, and He's classic. that time we had, you know, and seeing like you and him, kind of, you know, I was right there. I did like a ringside seat. <laughs> no, it was truly love at first sight, and you're such a was. pivotal part of that story from yeah, start yeah. to finish. We do we we talk about you all the time. You come up in so right. many stories around our dinner good. table. Good, good. Good. Well, all right. Well, I'm going to come. I mean, so one of the things that's not in the book is Australia, as I said earlier. And I did. I mean, when I met 
so Pete Morse took us. Have you been to a place called Wigram Island? Do you know where that is? No. So Wigram Island's in a place called the Wessel Islands. Do you know where they are? Oh, yeah. I really want to yeah, go. So, so Wigram's in the Wessel Islands. And I can remember Jacko Lucas, who we both know. Yaku Lucas, whatever he wants us to call him. Um, Yaku was crying to me. Oh, I found this new place called Wigram Island. I was like, yeah, yeah I went there 20 years ago, <laughs> which I did. You know, and I I know I can be an absolute arse sometimes. And that was a really arsey thing because he was so thrilled with this place. There's a guy, Josh, do you know Josh? Hutchins, yeah, he's running trips. Yeah, there. I've never met Josh, but I he's think great. Josh kind of opened it up. And But I went there with Pete Morse 20 years ago. What I didn't tell Yaku was that I couldn't fish for toffee. I, I mean, I was all of us were freshwater trout anglers. It was like my second saltwater trip, and we got smoked. We went to a place called the Cumberland Straits. You ever been there? No. Cumberland Straits, these two big cliffs that come out of the ocean, and there's a, there's a gap between them. And they call, and, and there's another place called the Hole in the Wall, and I may be mixing the two up. But anyway, the place I remember is these great big cliffs that come out of the sea, and you get this rip that comes between them. They're just cliffs. They're like it, it looks like a wall, massive, in the middle of nowhere. And you get this riptide and the fish all hang in the rip, you know, it comes through and then kind of pulls around. And I've never seen a biomass of maybe once in Colombia when the when the sardine run comes up, Colombian coast. But the biomass of fish was insane. But we couldn't get a fish in the boat because there's all these big sharks that the tax man who just monster everything. So you hook big queen fish, GTs, uh, every type of trevelli there is. Uh, and then they all get eaten by these big bronze whalers and tiger sharks. And but it was amazing. I mean, and so it is a real oversight. But as I say, volume one, right? So volume two is going to feature Australia and probably more than one chapter because Australia's got so much. And it is really an undersung destination. You know, people don't talk about Australia like they talk about Cuba or they talk about the Seychelles. But there's some wild fishing. I went and fished at... Um, Exmouth, you've been there? Oh yeah, love Exmouth. Yeah, I'm sure. Of course you have. Who did um, you go with? Did you go with Jono? Or did you go with Brad? No, nah, this is a long time ago. I mean, this was on that trip, that round the world trip. Yeah. Uh I'm not sure John was even there. This is two. No, he would he would not have been there then. There was a lovely couple, and I do have a weird kind of photographic memory. So Jen and Jen was the girl, they were, they were girlfriend, boyfriend. And now, I mean, I've said I've got a photograph. I can't remember his name now. They were lovely people, and they laughed at me. So we went down to this place with those radio masts. You've been there, so there's a beach at Exmouth, and it's got these massive radio masts, which I think I'm right in saying are the highest buildings in the Southern Hemisphere. And they're just radio masts. They're really tall radio masts, you know, held down with cables. And I was like, no, I just fly fish, and they're like, no, you don't. Not not here. Uh, and they gave me some horrible, great, you know, rooster popper about so big and and uh, and a spinning rod. And I whacked this thing out. And it's hard work. You've done that fishing. It's like hard work just bringing the thing in. Mm-hmm. It's like playing a two pound trout every cast, you know, just dragging this thing in. Totally. And then and the GTs wait until you're really knackered, you know, and it starts to get dark. And you, you've been reeling that thing in for an hour. And then they come out to play. And we just all got. And Je- Jen. Jen and I can't remember that guy's name. They were from a tackle shop called Blue Water, which is a tackle chain or was a tackle chain all up the west coast of Australia. And um, Jen got, we all hooked fish, but we got smoked. They just go straight into the coral, you know, and you can hang on as hard as you like, but they're just going to smoke you. But Jen got a GT about 50 pounds and she wouldn't, she was like, no, no, you're not photographing that. That's a baby. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I was like, no, I need to photograph. So she, you can see on her face, she's like, oh, come on then, because they catch fish twice that size off those rocks. Yeah. But I fished with them. They took me to a place called the Murian Islands, which is off of Exmouth. And the queen fish there, I can remember, as far as you could see, were busting. And we caught like big, like meter-long queen fish, yeah. like it was going out of fashion. But it's so long ago, and the quality of the pictures, I think I'm a better photographer than I was then. You know, the pictures yeah. don't do it justice. Um and you know, and the fishing was too good. That because you do have to have that discipline to say, all right, for photo time. And I was like, yeah, that'll do. Which I, I've got more discipline now. So pictures first, fishing second. But you know, Australia's got tons of that. You know, all around we went to amazing places all around the north. You know, I went to one place, um, Nulumbai. Yeah, I've heard of that. Go- I don't know if you know up there in the Northern Territories. And I went with a guy called Noel. 
we drove five hours through the eucalyptus forest and went barramundi fishing. And it was, he said, you won't catch anything till half one, which was to do with the moon and the tides. And he was spot on. I'm casting oh. away nothing. Enough. Half one, dying 18 pound barra, 20 pound barra, 15, just as many as you want. Oh, and, so and, I, and but I just don't have the pictures that do that justice. So, so I'm coming back. Uh, and, but I'd also love, because I know, yeah, I mean, we both know Simon Goldsworth, and Simon's coming back to the UK. I was so going to say, he's on his way back to you. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I would love to come and, I mean, Simon, I know Simon didn't fish for steelhead two years ago, three years ago. He said the run is so bad mm. that he's not going to fish. You know, and Simon, you know, Simon loves his fishing. Um, but I would hope that, I think it's been better, hasn't it, the last couple of years? We've had a great few years on the yeah. down low. Yep. Right. Right. So I'm coming back, whether you like it or not. We would love that. We would love that. We've I got a spot for you. Yeah. And so you listen, know. you are always welcome to, I mean, some terrible things. This is not the time. Like it's well, three days before Christmas. I'm not going to bitch on about the miserable stuff that's happening, which I often do on podcasts. Uh, so I'm going to keep it brief. The British government are allowing some terrible things to happen in the UK. And a lot of our rivers are literally full of shit. You know, they're allowing the water companies to pump human waste into those rivers whenever it rains. Uh, and it's killing the, the river Y, where I caught my first salmon that came in like a sack, as I told you. Um, you know, if you drive over the river Y, which is a beautiful river in a very beautiful valley, is now they've put all these chicken, like intensive chicken farms all the way along it. And they basically hose all of the shit into the river. And the Y, which was one of the most beautiful, full of ranunculus and stream of weeds and, you know, golden gravel and clear water is now like a sewer. It's like an open sewer. When you, I've got a buddy who lives there and he says when he drives across the bridge over the river um, in Hereford, he winds his windows up because of the smell. I mean, that is so, so you're welcome to come and fish here. But, um, you know, I, and and so many rivers. Uh, we've got so many problems in the UK. Um, what the water, the water companies have been privatised, and they're run for profit, not for, you know. And and people find it hard to believe, but you know, and it's not even British. I mean, Macquarie's. You probably know Macquarie Bank or Macquarie Bank, who are an Australian mm -hmm. bank. They own. They they to a great extent they own some of the biggest water companies, like regional water companies in the UK. And they are not running it for the good of the water and the fish in the river. They're running no, it for profit. Not. It is a scandal. So a lot of our fishing has collapsed. I, I just wrote a piece for a magazine that was um, like a, a, a wish list calendar for 2024. And I sent it to the editor and he said, well, where's the, where's the UK entry? And I said, you tell me where it is and I'll put it in. But there isn't anywhere that can compete with what you've got you know, on the Bulkley or, or you know, the, the, the Spey, the D, the Tay, these are iconic rivers. Yeah. Um, but they're they're just a shadow, an absolute shadow of their former selves. And it's really, you'll know a lot of the people that I know, you know, great Ian Gordon, Scotty McKenzie, you know, their rivers are just being destroyed. And it, anyway, I'm not going to go on. That's it. I'm, we're done with that because it's Christmas. Oh, and but so the, you put it on my radar. Thank you for putting it yeah. on my radar. I'll I'll use that information and have a think about what I want to do as far as um, discussing it. Right. Well, it's a big issue. And I mean, the Atlantic South, you're, so to go back to what we spoke about, you know, and I, and I tried to, because when you write a big book about all these different places, you want to, you know, I've met so many people that I fish with all over. Lalo in, in Mexico, I caught my first rooster fish with Lalo. And I love him to bits. And when when someone says, what's your favorite species? I don't want him to hear me saying salmon, like salmon are better than rooster fish. Nothing's better than a rooster fish, right? Uh, but there is something special about salmon. There's something, you know, when you think of them going all that way out there and they're under, you know, I often think, so every year if I meet, do you know Hawk and Norling? You ever met Hawk and? No. So Hawk and Norling is, he's Michael Fredine's big mucker. They they kind of grew up together. Daniel Pearson knows him. Right. And Hawk and invented the temple dog fly, you know that fly? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, so that was Hawkins. But then Michael kind of made it in a million different colours. But Hawk and dreamt up the original one. 
And whenever I see Hawken, I'm like, hello, and I give him a big hand. And he's like, I'm going through his pockets trying to get this. <laughs> I'm like a pickpocket. And when I first got to fish the Alta in Norway, which is, you know, one of the great privileges of my life, it cost a lot of money. And it wasn't a flag or a comp trip or anything. I paid good uh, cash. And Kath, I had to look Kath in the eye and say, uh, I'm going to go fishing and it's going to cost about £100 a minute because <laughs> you know, it's, it's insane. But I do not want to lie on my deathbed thinking I could have gone to the altar, right? And so I had to. Yeah. And um, and a, a friend of mine, Sasha Savage, invited me to go. And I, I, he said, do you want to know how much it costs? I said, no, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I went, that's all in the book, all about how, you know, you've got to go if you get the chance. David Profumo, did you ever meet David? Oh, God, David's you can meet all these people and, you, and go to all these places. But these are all the Brits, right? These are, So right. David got the chance. David's a very, his father was involved in a famous British political scandal. You'd never get, David's the nicest bloke you'd ever meet. But he turned down the altar and that's like, <laughs> that's like, don't do that. And it's, I know David, that is one of the great regrets of his life. And it always, maybe, maybe someone will say, you know, come, come and fish the altar. But the altar is an amazing you know, it's like a it's like a temple. I mean, in, in, when you're in that canyon, it's got this great big canyon, um, and you can hear the guy talking on the other side. And when I got to go there, I told I, I phoned Hawken and said, "What fly should I take?" And he said, "They're in the post." And he tied his flies are special, you know. And he sent me this bundle of beautifully tied flies, and with a little, you know, because salmon fishing is full of that mad sort of, you know what I mean, like that alchemy. So it said. Use this one if it's Thursday afternoon and it's raining, and use that one if it's you know what I mean. If the water's a bit coloured and and you know it's it, 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 it's you're about to drink some crazy stuff, and I thought for a long time I thought I'm not using them, but I did, and I caught my first Alta salmon on one of Hawkins uh, Sunray Shadows. So get on Hawkins, but I always used to literally make a joke out of trying to nick flies off him, and then I try and copy them. And I'm a ham. You've seen me trying to tie flies. Uh, I'm not the best. I can tie flies, but they're functional, you know. Sure, I can yeah. remember some drunken nights where you're tying these beautiful, really beautiful. You did those stackers. Do you remember all that uh -huh. stuff? With it? Yep. And I'm there with this kind of ham fisted mess and too much <laughs> glue and thread and shit. But I often, you know, and I find I find it frustrating. But I can. There's certain flies that I tie well, and um, I. Uh, I sit there at night time. I often time if I can't sleep. I get up, so I've got a little fly time room next to our bedroom, and I go in there and tie flies till I feel sleepy. Then I go to bed, and I'm tired. And those salmon are out there right now. Those salmon that we're going to intercept in Norway or Russia or wherever, and they're out there in the you know in that Arctic night right now, you know, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right up in the north in the Arctic Circle. And, you know, this weird thing's going to bring us together. I love that. And I just think they're the most heroic fish. You know, they're just amazing fish. That's so when romantic you them, when you think about it that way. You're right. They're yeah. out there in all these extremes. You know, and you're sitting there with cozy in our beds, flies. making fly. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. They come in and just like them, we all filter in and meet yeah. together and we congregate. We come together, right? Oh, yeah. that's so and beautiful. I, I love it. I can't kill one. I cannot kill one. You know, and, and I, you know, I mean, Again, I don't want, you know, it's so lovely to talk to you and I don't want to bring it down, right? Because I did a talk for the, I, I was very privileged to open the River D last year, this right. February last year. I was invited to make the first cast on the River D and I was thinking, sure, I hope the wind's not off my left shoulder because <laughs> I'm rubbish off my left shoulder still to this day. And I cast like you got, you know, uh, steelhead style, like cack handed, you know. Yeah. And Simon's yeah. always, Simon Topher Brown, they always say, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, when are you going to learn to cast left hand up? Um, and it was, and I had to cast off my left shoulder. But anyway, I've made a speech before I made the cast. and. I remember I'd written this speech and it was all about how we've got to save the River D and we do the and I thought, no, not today, not today. There's times for that stuff, you know, when because the D, I mean the D, so that first day of the season on the River D, that I bet there are a thousand people fishing. No one caught fish. And it was perfect conditions. Perfect. I mean, some years, first of Feb, you know, it's snow and ice and there's and everyone knows they're not going to catch anything, but it's like a you know, it's a celebration and you drink a few, maybe more than a few drams of whiskey and see your buddies and, you know, it's that thing. But it was perfect conditions and there wasn't a fish in the river, you know. And, and but I thought, 
don't make that miserable, worthy speech about how we've got to save the salmon because we have. But there are days when you've got to. So I talked about a buddy of mine who, who, um, a buddy of mine, Andy Blythe, he was a rugby player and fishing saved his life. He had a terrible accident, broke his neck. Um, and uh, his dad, to, I mean, he was suicide. He was a world class rugby player. He would have kicked the Aussies into touch for a start. <laughs> and he would have played the last time England won the the only time that England won the World Cup against Australia in 2003. He would have been in that team. I've no doubt of that. Uh, I photographed his wedding, by the way, um, as well. Um, but I but I made a speech about that and how his dad saw how black his mood was because he was broke his neck. He was paralyzed from the neck down for four months. He was told that's how he would be for the rest of his life. And through sheer bloody mindedness, he walked out of the hospital after 11 months on crutches. But the thing that really saved him was fishing. So his dad got him back into fishing and he loves, he lives on the River Tyne in, in the north of England. And the Tyne was great fishing. It's again, big problems now, but his dad got him fishing and it's honestly, it saved his life. And I thought that, and, that, and I, I'm pretty, I, I think that people, were quite emotionally you know they they could see that what that story was about and that's you know that's one of the things when you see what fishing can do you know it may gave him a reason to get up in the morning and now he's got a lovely he doesn't do much fishing at the minute mainly because the river's rubbish but he's got a lovely little kid he's about adelaide similar to adelaide like a force of nature um and uh you know that's that's made his life complete but but i do think there is a time not to you know not to grumble about all the shitty things that are happening to our rivers but there's also a time to get angry there's and I, and tell me when when it's time to shut up but i went to iceland um sea trout there's amazing sea trout sea run brown trout fishing in iceland and while i was there this is in october of this year they had a massive escape from one of the fish farms and all those fish because it was spawning time for the for the salmon the sea trout don't spawn for another six weeks uh, so they weren't spawning, but the salmon were spawning, and all these escapee fish from the from the farm got into the rivers, and then they'll muddy the gene pool. So the salmon, you know, the, kind of crosses their wires, so they don't know where to come back home, uh, and and basically destroys the wild DNA of those fish. And the Icelandics are like heroic; they don't they don't mess about. The Brits would be like, "Oh, we must do something." The Icelandics got spear fishermen to go and spear out as many of those wild, as those farmed fish as they could. And then they put them in a bunch of trucks and took them to the parliament in Reykjavik and dumped them on the steps and, and basically said, we're not having this. And I just think, um, Valor, so Arnie, have you ever met Arnie Balderson? Again, these are all people I know of but have not met. Arnie. So Arnie's great. He's, he, if, if you wanted someone to save your life by catching a salmon, Arnie's your man. And he is a character like a guy. You should get him on. You, you'd love Arnie. Yeah. Arnie's daughter, Valet, is a very beautiful woman um, and a great fisher. She um, and a bunch of her pals who are guides and caught up in, um, you know, in the whole fly. Because fly fishing is a big part of their revenue in Iceland. You know, people come from all over to fish in Iceland. They went to, to Reykjavik, to the town square, and they dumped all these rotten farm fish on the steps and made a big noise and said, we're not certain for this you know and it's really had a lot of repercussions and they're now um they're not going to grant any more licenses for the fish farms which are causing terrible damage you know even without the escapees because of the lice you know so the lice are jumping on the wild fish killing the wild fish da, 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 da. so and i think good for them you know because they are they're proactive you know and yeah. and that's what fishermen and fisher women need to do. We need to say we're not. Put, and the the Aussies are really good at it. The Australian fishing community don't put up with it, you know. And hats off, to, you know. And the Brits and the Aussies, you know, all about the cricket and the rugby and da da da. But I secretly don't tell anyone. I really admire the Australians because they they fight their corner and they say we are not putting up with this shit, you know. And good for them. And the Brits are just a bit lily livered, in my opinion. You know, we should we should say we are not. Put, and there are ways now with farmed salmon um you know close containment tanks um i've just got some salmon from iceland that's um that's close containment so no lice problems no diseases no pest no no, no um um you know none of the drugs that they're pumping the fish full of to fight the lice 
the mm. antibiotics because the lice bring disease and they're proliferating. So the Icelandics are finding a way to do it, you know, sustainably without messing up the wild fish. So it can be done. I said I wouldn't go on about it, but I do feel, you know, as I get older, I feel that as you've done, I feel that it's our responsibility to fight for for our kids, so that that my boys and and Adelaide and 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 all those kids get to go fishing, you know, and yeah. see Atlantic salmon or steelhead or whatever it is. Um, so we do need to to sort of galvanise ourselves and make a bit more. I just feel like the the it's a very British thing, wow. you know. Like I was saying earlier, you say to the Brits. Uh, did you did you like that? And, yeah, yeah. My mum, if I take my mum out to the pub, she'll say, I'll buy her a gin and tonic, which is what all mums in the UK drink. And this is the British disease in a nutshell. So she'll say, oh, that's flat. Like the tonic hasn't got any bubbles in it, right? Yeah. And then the waitress will come over, everything okay? And she, and I'll say, <laughs> so she'll say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. And I'll say, no, it's not fine because I'm a bulky bastard. <laughs> I'll say, and it's not fine. The tonic's flat. And the waitress will be fine. You know, it's not, it's not her tonic. Yeah. So she, I'm terribly sorry. And she goes off. And then my mum's on my case. My mum's 86. She's like, oh, how how embarrassing. And I'm like, mum, your tonic's flat. Speak up. But that is the British way. We're such cowards. You know, we don't we don't speak up. Well, I do, but a lot of us don't. So we need to do more of that. I but, do not um, see you as a coward at all. No. And I will no. take all of that on board. Actually, do you know who's, we're wrapping it up right now, but do you know who's here? Go on. Charles Barrett has just showed up at the door and we're going to have a little chat off the record here, but I want to just wrap it up for everyone else and say, thank you so much for coming All on right. the show. I'm going to link up your book and let's do this again. All right. I'd love to. I'd love to. And, and face to face, cause I'm going to come, come fishing with you this year for sure. 2024. We're going to go fishing. For Hell sure. yes. It's a date. Now, don't right. hang up. We're going to have a no, chat. No, I won't. Here. I won't. I won't.